Greetings and peace, everyone. My name is Salman Sheikh, as you're all aware. Thank you for always being here on my channel and supporting me and my work. Today, I'm joined by Douglas Duane Dietrich, a military historian, former U.S. Marine, somebody that has also worked at the Presidio military base as a research librarian, and somebody who will share a lot of the information that you won't get from anywhere else in terms of a lot of the World War II stuff, in terms of the, I guess, occult groups within the U.S. military, his own personal background, who he is, what he became to be, and what, what his purpose is today. I've been following Douglas since 2015. A little bit in the beginning of 2015 is when I first met Douglas Dietrich. And um, after, ever since then, I've been listening to him. A lot of people, they have to be willing to hear him out because his information is so grand and he's sharing a lot of great information that you must be willing to take your time and listen to him with an open heart. And Thank you. Um, I, I love my brother very much and I'm very glad to almighty God that he gave me the opportunity to um, interview him and get his message out to the world. So I'll, I'll give the stage to my brother so he can introduce himself and tell the viewers who he is and who is Douglas Dietrich and how he became to be who he is today. Bless you. Uh, I hope you can hear me, brother Solomon. Yes, my brother. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, uh, Allah be praised and uh, peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad, his messenger. I want to thank you so very much for the life you've led and uh, the fact that you're so kind to someone as myself. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring you as much into the conversation as possible. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here with us today. I know that Salman Sheikh has his own uh, wonderful uh, audience that he's built up over the years and uh, he's done such a wonderful uh, job with uh, communicating so many esoteric uh, subjects that are inaccessible otherwise to many people. And uh, as for I myself, he had first heard myself when I was uh, communicating with a person who at that time was a fellow Muslim, and uh, the by that I mean a fellow Muslim of Salman's. I myself am not a practitioner of the uh, faith of Islam, but certainly uh, emphasize the fact that uh, it is a, uh, a faith that struggles against the darkness just as Christianity does, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, we are all uh, brothers in the struggle. Uh, against the darkness and in the service of the creator and uh, hopefully the dialogue between Salman and myself will help people to understand that that greater struggle and uh, the united front of uh, faiths against uh, that struggle. Faiths that are more diverse than you might imagine uh, because one of the messages I've always brought up concerning Christianity has been a message of ecumenicalism and the need to uh, understand that other faiths are not contrary to Christianity. So uh, in the case of uh, Salman Sheikh, when he first heard myself was when I was talking about uh, the persecution of Muslims in England. And uh, so it was around that time when I was disambiguating how the English understand uh, the different Asian cultures. Uh, and they have, because of their colonial and imperialist past, a bit more of a nuanced uh, perspective on Asians uh, in disambiguation from Orientals. These are still, we have to understand uh, controversial terms, but uh, they have an understanding that there's a nuanced difference or quite, uh, quite how would I say, pronounced differences between South Asians and Far East Asians. Yeah. And that's something Americans don't even grasp uh, because Americans to them, we're simply all Asians are all foreigners. And uh, with that in mind, because I made that disambiguation and perhaps because I was talking about the gangs that needed to be formed in self-defense of these uh, communities in England, uh, London and other areas outside of uh, London, there are many, uh, you'd call them uh, Asia towns or little orients that uh, have ethnic enclaving. And uh, so people have to defend themselves against attacks from uh, many extremists, uh, the uh, right-wing neo-nationalists that have uh, taken to scapegoating them. And uh, they are, of course, a very dynamic 
uh, part of the English economy, which would be much the poorer without them. So we're dealing with this auto-destructive nativism in many places on either side of the Atlantic. And uh, when I spoke of those issues, I believe is when um, Salman Sheikh began to understand that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. And perhaps you can give us some details on exactly what it was that I'm trying to remember. Oh, I think it was at that time where when I first came across to you, it was uh, talking about the grooming gangs where a lot of the um, Pakistanis, I guess, were involved in uh, grooming scandals in terms of um, uh, the women and the girls in England. It's especially, uh, I guess, uh, targeting Caucasian girls. And it was uh, the aspect of the grooming gangs. And that's when I listened to you. And uh, I realized that this man is speaking the truth. What he's saying, I'm not finding any truth anywhere else. Everyone else is either gatekeeping or they're not really fully explaining the truth, defending Islam. And the way that you defend everything and the way that I've heard you throughout the years across these different subjects, I know that there is a reason why the enemy has always been after you. And then there's a reason why everyone of a good conscience and good spirit needs to back you in your endeavors and get your voice out there to humanity. Thank you. I deeply appreciate that. And uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, scandals which you speak, and it's very important that uh, you have the courage uh, to face that because uh, we all need to come to grips with the fact that whatever uh, culture that uh, we are familiar with, whatever culture we identify with, obviously uh, there, that there is a there are going to be negatives. And in terms of uh, what I presented at first when I was introducing that topic, and we don't need to make this the, uh, of course, thematic of today's interview, but it's yeah, important yeah. to go into this at least to a degree uh, when uh, what our uh, brother Solomon has just had the courage to uh, confront. And uh, he did then was the fact that one of the things I was bringing up was uh, there is political correctness as well. I was speaking about the, uh, the right wing uh, radicalization that has led to violence uh, against Asians. And that of course is what's on my mind foremost because it is impacting Asians in America right now profoundly and, yeah. and to a degree Asians in, uh, in England because of the COVID-19 affiliation that is connected between uh, the disease and Asians and uh, the kind of propagandization that has led to them being scapegoated. But at that time, uh, and this goes in cycles, uh, the, what, was, what was needed in terms of exposure was the left wing and very politically correct uh, need to uh, turn certain minority groups into saints. And uh, there are those among any culture who are not. So in the case of what I believe was Rotherham, it was uh, either Rotherham or Rotherham. I don't remember the exact uh, pronunciation of the town. Uh, it, you know, some research could be done concerning these grooming gangs, but I'm not quite sure that's the term that was used at the time. But the one thing that I do remember very distinctly was that uh, we were in a situation where many of these people who were of Pakistani descent simply because England had colonized all of South Asia, the Raj uh, from uh, what today would be Pakistan through to Burma. And mm -hmm. therefore, um, after the collapse of their empire, then what happened was that many people uh, were um, coming to England who needed shelter from the collapse of the Raj. And uh, so they developed their own communities. And the end result was that these uh, communities uh, ended up victimizing some local Caucasians. In this case, mainly the woman. And it became like a safari for many wealthier uh, South Asians to come to this town. It's between England and the and, and Scotland in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom. And the one thing I remember distinctly was uh, people kept writing to myself, complaining that oh, what you're talking about has nothing to do with us. That's in England if they were Scottish. And if they were English, they would write to me, what you're talking about has nothing to do with us. That's in Scotland. 
So wherever the hell it is, the one thing I know <laughs> is that nobody wants any affiliation with it. The, the English claim that it's the Scots, the Scots claim it's the English, yeah. whatever the hell jurisdiction it's in, it was dominated essentially by a foreign cabal uh, that was exploiting the young girls growing up in the town. And what I was saying was that nobody in England was willing to pursue it because it was politically too sensitive. It would make them look racially insensitive. It would look racist to crack this ring open. And so that was the thing that I pointed out. So that is very much to the credit of Salman Sheikh that uh, he sees the evil in terms of certain nation, you know, certain people from his own culture and yeah. the evil that they're perpetrating and that he was able to confront that, which is something even the English themselves can't do. So thank you very much. And, and maybe you could take a moment to explain to us <clears throat> that there are in every culture people who may identify with it in the, on the surface, but they're really not practicing its, its virtues. And the, this is the problem that all cultures deal with. Uh, these, these are uh, people who are not uh, practicing Islam. They're not practicing uh, any form of spirituality. These are just lustful, uh, very, uh, very, uh, they're creatures on the low evolutionary scale in terms yeah. of any sense of uh, uh, empathy for their fellow humans. So, um, yeah, if you could uh, give us a bit of, uh, shall we say, just a, just some more um, detail in that uh, regard, and I'll, I'll take it from there. Yes, Brother Douglas, thank you for that. And yes, that's the reality, my brother, is that the aspect and the fight between good and evil, or light and dark, as many say, exists in all races, religions, countries, groups, and species of this earth and beyond. And the reason being is that you have people that pray five times a day. Some of them are not good people. You have some of them that go to church every Sunday. They're not good people. It's that aspect of the darkness in one's heart or the light in one's heart. And I'm somebody that has basically um, seen love, peaceful, and humanity in all beings of this earth, whether they be human or non-human, Muslim, non-Muslim. And even in my own community, when I visited Pakistan, a lot of them have a colonial mindset. And I see a lot of them were begging me, hey, can you apply and get me to America? Can you help me get to America? And I told them, I told some of them that you have a better life over here than what, what you're going to have to deal with there. But they just have this mindset that I'm not going to be successful unless I go to one of those countries, like a Western country. And, you know, this, I guess this um, perverted image that Hollywood or the adult industry has kind of put out about, you know, white women to a lot of these men where they think Western women are easy, not knowing Islam itself is a matriarchal religion, if you really go into its occult and mystified background, as I have as a Sufi Muslim, that heaven lies at the feet of your mother, what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, and you have to respect your mother as your daughter, as your sister, as your wives. They have the right to own property, choose their husbands, do all of this stuff. And what we see in that part of the world, I recently had an Afghan woman reach out to me too. And she said, what you see there are cultural crimes and cultural customs that, that were taking place before Islam even came to those lands. And uh, once Islam came after the conquest and all that, then they mixed in their tribal customs and all of that stuff with the uh, Islamic values, as you see with the all of the singing and dancing that they do in um, Pakistani Muslim weddings, you know, by religious law, you're not supposed to do that. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are stuck in their lower nature in terms of sex, I guess, repressed feelings. They're just like super repressed in terms of their lust, their sexual feelings, materialism. They're always trying to one up each other. None of them are following the true teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that's why they're suffering because Almighty God does say that once you follow what I tell you to, then you will have peace in your life where you will, once you make peace with yourself, the, the creator and the species around you, that's when you will have peace in your life. And that's what I try to tell those people that you, you continue to let these elements play you against one another. And uh, you just have to learn how to be better. That's exactly, you know, what I learned from Brother Douglas and what I came to in my own understanding. And um, it's important that we come to this uh, conclusion that humans think, my Brother Douglas, that it's always about them. And I, and I tell them, you know, once I got into my mystical background, 
I realize is that there's a lot taking place around us that we can't see with our naked eye. And I tell the human family, if you want peace within the human race, first and foremost, fix your own home, which is stop fighting with each other about race and religion. First, fix your own self. Find the oneness and teachings which all religions are teaching you, which is a conduct of a good life and a good moral background. And then make peace with the angels and jinns and reptile, insect, vampire, all of the beings that Allah put on this earth. Every being has a purpose, and we're all here to love and respect each other, live and let live. And that's what I'm trying to teach the human people. I go to my local park, I see trash all over the place. Uh, you know, it hurts me that what are we really contributing to the earth? And I listen to great people and brothers like Douglas who are telling the truth, but nobody's listening to them. Nobody's listening to me. So we need to keep up this fight. So I'll, I'll hand it over to my brother so he can tell people who he is, his background, and we'll just continue to build upon that so people know who he is and what his message is for humanity. Bless you. Uh, honestly, it, that's overwhelming in terms of uh, all of the subjects that brings up. The, so just so people understand, uh, I myself am uh, known as the renegade military historian, and I uh, very much want to be here. We're going to um, have at least a minimum of three hours on this interview. It might stretch a little overboard, uh, depending on how long that uh, our brother Salvi can stand without uh, breaking for, um, I would guess, dinner at, at this point. Yeah. Uh, so we'll... Uh, you know, we'll just work it organically. But uh, in terms of uh, how he and I sort of encountered each other and he followed what I was saying after that point in time, much of what I say has to do with World War II. So we do have a book out that we've recently published, and uh, that is The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II. And of course, it's uh, already meeting with tremendous resistance and hostility. And uh, the uh, first reaction that people have is, is just uh, reflexive shutdown, uh, automatic denial. The cognitive dissonance is just too much for them. And people would rather believe in statistically impossible aliens as they misunderstand them uh, rather than uh, accept something that is glaring in their face by the evidence that's all around them. And uh, what I do as a renegade military historian is I bring up all the circumstantial evidence uh, that uh, there is to be had uh, to show the West uh, and the uh, former Soviet Union, whom we now refer to collectively as the Russians in terms of their core constituency, what was their core republic, that they lost the Second World War to the Japanese. Now, the funny thing about this, what is so ironic and so racist, is that uh, all of these allies fought against the Third Reich on the surface world. Uh, and uh, they basically uh, have been insisting for years that somehow, quote unquote, the Nazis, and I hate to use that term because it has become nothing more than a slur. Uh, so when I refer to the Nazis, you'll hear me tend, you'll, you'll hear me tend to use terms like the National Socialists, simply because that's less triggering, that has a less triggering effect because people have been indoctrinated uh, to the extent where they react reflexively without thought. And the w way that they react is through unconditional hatred. Now, um, in terms of where we're at, that's medievalist thinking. And to put this into some perspective for our listeners so they understand how we are truly in a new dark age, a dark age that was introduced by the allies uh, on this earth, despite the fact that they lost the war, losing a war and winning a war, uh, contrary to what you might think, uh, doesn't necessarily put you suddenly in a position of power or disempowerment to the degree that you might believe. A good example is today is Confederate Memorial Day in some states. And uh, the Confederate States of America, while uh, militarily, uh, quote unquote, having lost the war, mm. ultimately won the peace. And they won the peace simply by extending many of the uh, racially suppressive laws of the Deep South throughout all of the United States during the Jim Crow era. 
and ultimately leaving us with the legacy of what we're still dealing with today in wake of the Derek Chauvin uh, trial. And uh, so if um, you don't understand that history, I'll cover it briefly later tonight. Uh, you know, later in this arc of narrative, we'll try and limit it to, say, for instance, when I'm on alone in a monologue or with I'm, I'm with Team Dietrich uh, on my own um, Skype uh, communicated program. And I say that as just a little, uh, just, just having a little fun there because we had some difficulties with zoom with getting on this yeah. afternoon i'm just so old the zoom is of course got its own issues compared to skype but um my point is with that um that when it comes to the complications of say for instance north versus south in the american civil war and how one side may have been able to claim military victory based on many uh obvious uh, factors the so-called vanquished uh, was never vanquished and ultimately managed to triumph in the imposition of its culture over the rest of America. And uh, for those of you, it, it, just to say it quaintly, in the more nuanced aspects of uh, the popularity of the South in America, everything from Elvis Presley to the Dukes of Hazard, uh, these, these were very Southern tropes and cultural perspectives that were popularly uh, disseminated throughout the United States, including the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, where there were episodes where they waved the Confederate States flag. By the way, I'm not, what, what I'm saying here is not uh, where I'm bemoaning this or, or, or saying that this isn't this terrible. I'm simply stating a fact that the, cul the culture of the South managed to impose itself through NASCAR and various other sports and, yes. and popular, and popular uh, entertainment onto uh, the America in one sense. And that was to normalize, that served to help normalize it's uh, more sinister aspects, the more racially suppressive aspects like gerrymandering and vote suppression in many other ways. So there we are. So th th that's just kind of an example there, barely touching the surface. So when it came to Japan winning the war, uh, this uh, enabled Japan to become a world power, yes, but it's not a world power that was asserting itself. It's not a world power that was asserting itself in the manner of the, of the powers that lost. Uh, so when it came to the powers that lost, uh, they were essentially uh, operating on uh, the level of trying to spread themselves like a cancer in order to try and prove to their own population bases that they had won. And uh, so if that sounds like, oh gosh, this is incredibly convoluted and it's rationalizing, you know, let me explain to a degree and, uh, and, and I'll bring it up in such a uh, manner that uh, you can understand. Uh, and I'll do that uh, as quickly as I can, but right now, accept this being uh, the major challenge. We are uh, basically uh, talking about the fact that the Japanese won the war, mm -hmm. but what the West was more willing to accept was this concept that the Nazis had somehow won. And this has began to permeate more and more the alternative rightist or the radicalized conspiracy subculture mm -hmm. until it's almost like a given that when you're entering uh, the uh, conspiracy, the subculture, you run across this basic concept. And the basic concept is that the Nazis really won the war. And this, this is indicative of a form of racism. It doesn't matter that the Third Reich is not extant on the surface world and that Germany is not imposing itself as a major power across the earth. What everyone is saying is that the Nazis had somehow infiltrated the West in particular and converted all of the Western governments into some kind of Nazified governmental system that is now going to kill us all with this mass extermination conspiracy, whether it involves vaccines, uh, and uh, it only involves vaccines because they're topical because of COVID-19, but before COVID-19, it was through whatever else people could imagine uh, that there was a genocidal agenda on the part of their governments, mm -hmm. which of course is, uh, Let's try and put this into some perspective, because again, the adult world is a, it, it's a giant playground of the mind. There are a million shades of gray that the psychotic mind cannot deal with. 
So if we try and um, take a look at the psychotic mind and what Americans, what British people, what the, they in particular, Anglo-Americans, but all the Western world to degree, and the Russians on a similar path, what they all have is a mass psychosis. And the mass psychosis is uh, based on the uh, fact that uh, you are convinced you won the First World War and at, at the Second World War, the First World War and the Second World War for that matter. And, uh, and then you are convinced that somehow the Nazis managed to turn that victory totally around. And uh, none of this makes any sense. None of it is uh, logical, but that is the mindset of almost everyone who thinks they're an independent thinker. And so this racism entails the rationalization of, say for instance, information that I released uh, long ago while I was a Department of Defense research librarian. And so for those of you who don't know that about myself, I worked for almost 10 years as a Department of Defense research librarian. And uh, obviously this is a situation we're going to have some problems with because even when people go to Amazon to check out the book, uh, The Roswell Deception, uh, then they're going to notice that my biography is not up there. Only my co-author's uh, biography is up there. And uh, so when uh, it comes to this kind of difficulty of people understanding me, uh, the point is that nothing is put out there about myself. And when you look up anything about myself, chances are you'll probably find uh, attacks against my character. Mm -hmm. And uh, these attacks against my character are relentless and they're incessant and uh, they are completely twisted and warped from any reality out of context. And uh, their intention is simply to render myself, quote unquote, literally unbelievable. And uh, the very attack on the source of information is all that the people who want to keep you in ignorance have. Yes. All they can do is attack the source of information rather than, than the information uh, itself. And to give you an example of Japan's power after World War II, it was a very soft but decisive power, a uh, power that they decided that they were going to impose only when it mattered. And probably the best example of this was through a female scientist that guaranteed you've never heard of and who she saved the world. To give you an example about this Japanese female scientist who saved the world that you've never fucking heard of, uh, you had the Americans and the Soviets trying to prove that the bomb won the war. And when they tried to prove that the bomb won the war after World War II, and bear in mind, the uh, Americans are going through various rationalizations at this point in history, whereas for decades, for generations, they were trying to convince their own people that they won World War II against Japan with the bomb. Mm. Then they've changed it recently, where if you look this up, you will find out what I'm saying is true. All of their academics, their intelligentsia, are revisioning and reimagining, literally in a fantastical sense. They're reinterpreting the war, the Second World War, where the Russians won everything. And you will hear this constantly amongst Americans because America is without culture. It has no culture of its own. And because it has no culture of its own, being essentially a displaced culture, all of its actions in history are a reenactment of cultural echoes. And I'm gonna bring this back to the Nazis, to the Japanese, mm -hmm. but today being a historical expert that I am. And this isn't an avocation. This isn't a hobby. I was a professional historian as a librarian for the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. Understand, I know of what I speak because I did the research by which commissioned officers could write their papers, their theses, so they could enter these papers for promotion. So when officers were promoted from one rank to another, 
I was the man who they bribed, who they paid to write their papers for promotion in terms of historical thesis. So I was the man who got them promoted. I'm the man who made men generals. I'm the man who gave them historical information they would never otherwise have. And as a research librarian who did that, understand they never understood the context of any of this. They want it. I want a term paper, so to speak. These are basically term papers. And in the military, they're called like promotional prospectus. So you take one of these things and the officer says, oh, I'm going to prove how America really performed, uh, shall we say, uh, moderately well, or even stellar professionalism, as they would want to say, in terms of its combat performance in Vietnam. And I would write that paper for them, presenting the facts in such a way that they could sell that, and they would get promoted on the basis of that. So in other words, I'm propagandizing for them. I'm revisioning history into a selling point that enables them to get promoted. They don't need to be telling the truth. They're trying to make what they're selling about their interpretation of history, make it look as if they would be fit for promotion, which is important for you to understand because then you finally understand that all commissioned officers in the United States military are politicians in uniform. This has nothing to do with military performance. This has nothing to do with professionalism in some kind of operational sense. These are men who are selling a historical fantasy to each other to the point where they've reinforced that fantasy among each other to the point where they believe it. And these people are now as misled and as deluded as you. And the important aspect of that, so you understand the fact that you live in a military junta, that you live in a military society. So that, uh, say for instance, compare it to the former Soviet Union. The former Soviet Union had, I'll save way to that through a kind of real short tangent comparison. If I were to tell you Mexico effectively, because its oil is so controlled by outside interests, because its natural resources are so plundered by foreign corporations indirectly through their front companies in Mexico, that in Mexico, even though it's got a growing economy, it really doesn't have an economy that the Mexicans are themselves participating in other than in the norm, in the main, for, for that which we can count as real income, narcotics. So you would say at that point, if you were an economist, effectively, Mexico's economy isn't dependent on drugs. Mexico's economy effectively is drugs. Mm -hmm. This is basically the cartels that run Mexico at the effective level. So we move from there to the former Soviet Union. The former Soviet Union, unlike the rest of the world, did not have a military industrial complex. The former Soviet Union was in and of itself nothing but a military industrial complex. That was all they had. And they had nothing else. All they were able to do, all they were able to offer the world was war. Unfortunately, Russia itself has inherited that. So with that economy based on nothing but militarization, you could say effectively, oh yeah, it's Upper Volta, which is an African country in case you don't know your geography. It's a small third world, undeveloped African country. You could say that the former Soviet Union is Upper Volta with intercontinental rockets. And uh, you've got this mouse with a mighty right arm. That right arm is the military. And the rest of the Soviet Union economically was a mouse. It, it's still that way right now on the world scene. And the Russians, having outlined their situation, come back to America and its military industrial complex. And you can argue, well, we are not a military industrial complex in the sense the Soviet Union was. We simply have one that's very powerful and takes up a lot of space literally over half your fucking economy, <laughs> then you would have to acknowledge, what does that mean when someone is a commissioned officer as opposed to a non-commissioned officer? Like the man who raised and guided me, a three war veteran, a sailor named George Dietrich. Mm. This individual was in World War II, Korea and Vietnam. He served in the gunboat patrols in China before World War II was declared. This was a man who was through effectively four wars. And uh, this man was non-commissioned. 
Now, what that means is per the Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, and I can tell you all of this with extreme professional confidence and certainty because I was a Department of Defense Research Librarian. I did research for military lawyers, for military attorneys, what they would call JAGs, Judge Advocate Generals. So I can tell you that a non-commissioned officer, when they're not paid, they don't have to fight. That means anyone from the level of a private all the way up to a master sergeant is essentially a mercenary by definition of the UCMJ. In other words, if they don't get paid, they don't have to fight. Brings us back to the Civil War. At the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union Army had not been paid for months, and the generals had to go around hat in hand. You can look this up and verify it yourself, begging the men to fight, saying, oh, wait, we know we didn't pay you for months and months. We know you haven't been paid, but by God, this is the last battle. If we win this, that we win the war, please fight for us. This is the generals pleading before their men because they had stolen all the money. So the men were stupid enough that they went to war, fought the Battle of Gettysburg, and the historical result is still in contention operationally, but the end result was a victory for the Union. In terms of uh, this kind of begging and pleading for men to fight, which you can verify on your own, this is a situation in which the Union was so corrupt it didn't deserve to win. And this was where the union's commissioned officers were stealing all the money. That brings us back to what does that mean? What is a commissioned officer that they have the power to do that, to not even pay their men? Mm -hmm. uh, a commissioned officer, by contrast to a non-commissioned officer, is someone who has stock in the nation. In other words, it doesn't matter whether the commissioned officer gets paid or not. The commissioned officer is a shareholder in America as effectively a corporation. Even though this was a construct well before we came to these models of social existence, the founding fathers were elitist. These were white slave owners. These were plantation owners. And these founding fathers with their slaves and their plantations were an entirely different species than the peasants, as they would have called them in Europe, which were basically the normal American citizens working on the farm who constituted their militias. So when the founding fathers said, oh, we can't run this war for independence, which lasted eight years, to try and put this into perspective for you, in terms of a legally declared war with a definable commencement point and end point, that eight-year war was longer than World War II by the popular American definition, which was half that amount of time. So the Iraq conflict, the Vietnam conflict, none of these were declared wars. So in terms of declared wars, as is conservatively and conventionally understood, the American Revolutionary War was the longest declared war in American history. So you had this incredibly long revolutionary insurgency in which the founding fathers said, we've got to get these peasants to fight for us. So they had to not only have these peasants become militia like the Viet Cong, they had to have a regular standing army. And so they created their own People's Army of Vietnam. That's the difference between the communist regular forces with armored columns with tanks and mechanized units that overran Saigon in 1975 and the difference between the Vietnam that were fighting the Americans all the way up through the Tet Offensive. So these were the irregulars, the insurgents, the militia as the Americans would manifest them and the regular army is what we have today that has nothing to do with militia and is antithetical to militia in every way, that is what the founding fathers were trying to get started. And to get it started so, so that they could keep the peasants forever separate from the nobility, the plantation owners, the slave owners, they developed the non-commissioned versus the commissioned officer system. So the non-commissioned officers, no matter what, the end result is you're not committed to America, you're simply paid to fight. And if you're not paid to fight, you don't have to fight. That is the Uniform Code of Military Justice, whereas the officers, you have no choice. You are committed to America, the United States rather, the constitutional entity, the constitutional republic as you've invested your family 
This is why officers' children become officers and they have dynasties of officers in America. So these officers are, they own stock in the nation. And as stockholders in the nation, they run your nation. Your nation is effectively a military junta. There are many other nuances to this I could go into historically, but that should give you the basic point. And because of this, they are invested in telling you lies about how they won World War II. And World War II is the basis for their taking all of your money. The overwhelming majority of the American budget goes to the American military. And it's all based on the big lie they won World War II. And the big lie they won World War I in the sense that uh, you don't understand how World War I even ended. Most people don't understand how World War I ended. Here's, here's an example of your average American misunderstanding of war itself. Like if I say, oh, look, um, there's a war and that's held someplace. And uh, how do you conceive the end or the beginning of a war as popularly understood? Your average person is going to say, well, that's when nations are invaded and people lose their country if they lose. So, well, then what happened in World War I when Germany was never invaded? Nobody invaded Germany in World War I. And yet everybody says, oh, the Americans won the war, but they never dwell on it. They never dwell on it. They never say, well, how was the war won? What happened? Uh, without going into all of the deep nuances of that, take this fact as pertinent, Germany was never invaded. And because Germany was never invaded, you can't say a war is won by invading the nation. You don't have to invade a nation for a nation to simply have a regime change, which you did not even instigate. So this is what happened in Russia with the collapse of the Tsar. This is what happened in Germany with the abdication of the Kaiser. So nobody really won World War I. That's not just an exercise in semantics. That's simply, obviously, proven by history itself because if somebody had won World War I, there wouldn't have been World War II. <laughs> it's that simple. So then when you get to the point of World War II, then you say, okay, now Germany was invaded. Yes, then the government has changed. And yet people rationalize that the Nazis somehow won because, oh, well, what, how, how did the Nazis win? Well, we brought them all over here. Now, when I was a Department of Defense Research Librarian, I released information about Operation Paperclip. I regret having done that. I regret having done that because the information I released could not be handled by the public because it was simply manipulated by the military so that they could feed you a line of shit with it and say, oh yeah, we brought them all over here as if bringing over a bunch of engineers was somehow going to change your country politically. That's like saying, oh, look, we got a bunch of, uh, you know, Pakistanis who are working with computers in England, and that's why the British are all Muslim. You see, the British are all really Muslim because they got a bunch of Pakistanis who are working their computers. I mean, it's an insane projection. This is the insanity of that kind of logic. Uh, you have a bunch of guys who are technical advisors technical advisors they are not political advisors uh and this is the but again it's part of the racism what it really comes down to is racism americans and british and the west can conceive of the nazis somehow imposing themselves over the west because they give them that power because they're white they say well they're white they're capable but with the asians because they can't imagine asians coming over here and somehow doing anything then they say that, oh, well, we had to have defeated them. And yet throughout the 80s, people might remember that everyone was complaining about the Japanese buying up everything in the United States. So that was before, of course, uh, Solomon was born, and uh, which is just, you know, mind blowing to me. But uh, so he doesn't actually remember that, but he could easily look that up. Oh, well, that was an enormous fear in that decade before he was born. Mm. But in terms of the Japanese and um, their winning of the war, to give you an example of soft power, when it comes to Americans, because they're not military experts, they will say that uh, Americans lost the Vietnam War. And they will say that as if it's fact. They will just say, oh, the Vietnamese defeated America in Vietnam. Now that never happened. And what you had was a political withdrawal of American forces. 
And uh, whereas in World War II, they'll say somehow the Americans won World War II against the Japanese. Let me try and put this into some perspective for you, for those of you who are, who are historically ignorant. When you have something like World War II, most people forget, and they call it the Forgotten War. There was this peninsular conflict called the Korean War. And people tend to forget it because it is still ongoing. North Korea and South Korea are still legally at war with each other. And therefore, Americans might say if they looked at that conflict, they might say, okay, it was a tie. So somehow America won World War II against the Japanese, uh, went into some kind of tie on the Korean conflict, and then lost Vietnam. And the whole logic of this, while still maintaining a military with nuclear power, almost complete dominance of the air, is beyond preposterous. It's like literally impossible for you to even entertain this contradiction, and yet all Americans do. Well, to try and put this back into some perspective for you, when the Americans were in Vietnam, they were occupying Vietnam, and they were fighting Vietnamese. When the Americans were in Korea, they were occupying Korea, and they were fighting Koreans, mm -hmm. as well as the communist Chinese who entered the conflict. When the Americans were occupying Japan, they were fighting the Japanese. Only the Japanese were on mainland China. Mm. And so on mainland China is where the Japanese had installed over 90% of their military. Over 90% of their military remained there for years. Uh, specifically speaking, half a decade. And during that period of time, America was in talk down with the Japanese empire and these talk down processes towards peace were necessary so that America could uh, make it look like it won the war while surrendering to the Japanese. And in terms of surrendering to the Japanese, they surrendered completely. They opened their markets. And in the first speech delivered by President Harry Truman on national television, and you can look this up, you can do the research yourself, uh, the first nationally televised broadcast in human history was Harry Truman saying that we are at peace with Japan. That was in 1952, 1953. It was right after the conclusion of the Japanese-American peace treaty becoming effective. For those of you who don't know, there is a San Francisco peace treaty that was signed between Japan and the Anglo-American powers. It was never signed by the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has been superseded by the new Russian empire, which is still legally at war with Japan. They're in the same position with Japan that North and South Korea are in. Japan and Russia today are at war. They have been at war for years. They have been in a state of legal war. Peace has never been declared. For those of you who don't know. So when the intelligentsia, the academia tries to convince you it wasn't the bombs that won World War II, it was Stalin. It was the Russians who won World War II. They invaded Manchuria and took the Japanese out of the war. They're trying to impose upon the Russians all the mystical power that Americans used to imbue upon the atomic bomb. And because the Americans have no culture of their own, they're always searching for a master race. They're always searching for a culture that they can believe in. And originally, and the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948, which Harry Truman voted to recognize and recognized Israel just hours before Yosef Stalin did, in a race to the bottom, they both, Stalin and Truman, were in a race to recognize Israel, and Truman got there first. Basically, that became the culture which Protestant evangelical Americans began to worship. You had this Protestant evangelical worship of Israel. That means Christ is coming back. That means the apocalypse is coming. Israel is on earth again. Israel's on the map. This means that the end days are coming, and therefore, Americans had this fervent religious worship of the Jewish people, of Israel in particular, as if they were the master race. And that echoed upon Jews in America, this kind of respect for them. And this is why when you see films like 
Joan of Arc. When Joan of Arc was released in theaters, you had this Serbian woman uh, who's playing Joan of Arc that was released in the theaters in the 1990s. And you have, I believe it was Dustin Hoffman, this old Jewish guy playing God. And this is how Americans envision God. He's Jewish. That is to them, that's God. It's got to be God. This is so to them, the Jews are the relatives of the boss. They're, they're his blood relations. And therefore, uh, we, they're basically most Americans effectively do not follow Christ. They worship the Jew. That is the most important point that they had going for years, and it manipulated, it motivated their entire foreign policy. All of that has changed, even though Trump did the unthinkable and recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which no one had ever done. And so people understand this. If you were to look up in a dictionary like the Encyclopedia Britannica or any kind of dictionary, the capital of Israel, you'll find, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It was always that way for generations. It's a lie. No nation on earth recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. They looked at Israel as an occupying power of the Palestinian state, and they all had their embassies, which is, of course, the important point of foreign relations in Tel Aviv, Yafo, the financial capital of the state of Israel. Therefore, they referred to it as the state, as in an occupying apartheid regime. And yet when Trump said, okay, we're going to end that and we're going to move it to Jerusalem, our embassy, they did something no other nation dared to do. Now, you might say, oh, this is great and it's revolutionary. No, it's simply he's following this old reactionary white evangelical agenda that he finally realized in his presidency, but it's well behind the rest of the world because it's well behind his own public because now his radicalized right-wing base no longer looks to the Jewish people as the end-all be-all, they look to the Russians. Their main sponsorship comes from Russia. Their main hero is Vladimir Putin, whom Trump is simply an extension of. So once you see the world in that reality, which it is, that is the reality that people may spend all their time denying. And the more Trump denies it, the more he uh, verifies it. Uh, If there were no Russia issue, he wouldn't need to even dwell on it. But he dwells on it himself, which exposes the reality of the Russian issue. He is a puppet of Vladimir Putin and uh, will be running again in the near future as such. Now, in terms of that being said, that being out of the way, the end result is this is why the right wing has mobilized behind Russia is because the academia and the elite, which once was propagandizing for the Soviet Union in the early days of the 60s, the 70s, academia was infamously left wing, supported by the Soviet Union, Professors would visit the Soviet Union. Professors were right wing. Those same professors now are saying Russia won World War II. These are now radicalized to the right instead of the left. Russia is still behind it. They've simply changed the end of the political spectrum from which they're operating. This is where we're at now. So once we've gotten that out of the way, then you get to the point of soft power. When it comes to Harry Truman's speech, it was centered on the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which was signed in um, 1952. And 1951, it was signed in September of 1951, and it went into effect in April on the birthday of Emperor Hirohito across the ID line, across the international date line, whereas here it would have been his birthday Eve day on the 28th of April, 29th of April, depending on which side of the international dateline you're on in 1952. So you have a peace treaty, which you can look up, the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which was signed in 1951 in September, went into effect in April of 1952. And so it took years of talk downs to get to that peace treaty being signed. When it was signed, Harry Truman got on national television, the first time any president ever went on national television, the first television broadcast that was ever a national broadcast was Harry Truman 
effectively surrendering to the Japanese, saying we are peace with Japan, and uh, effectively saying our markets are open to them. And at that point, American industry began to die. And everything about their automobiles to their chemical industries like Kodak began to be run into the ground by the Japanese who had far higher technology and produced digital cameras to overtake everything that was chemical camera oriented that the Americans were producing in upstate New York, where of course my father came from. So that's a, a particular point to myself, but it's a particular point to all of you, uh, is that Kodak camera company, uh, Eastman Kodak used to be the source for how you held your memories in the world, for how you recorded your family experiences. Yes. All of that ended and everything became digitized based on Japanese technology. So around that time, the Japanese took over. Now, that's easy to relay. And everybody who's older than Salman Sheikh remembers that. But uh, in terms of what we have with the situation concerning, say, for instance, an exercise of that soft power. If you want a demonstration of it, here was America and the Soviet Union in particular, but also the British and the French. And they're all blowing up these bombs. They're all uh, conducting above ground nuclear testing. All of these people were just blowing up bombs uh, with impunity, with abandon. And it was all over the Pacific, all over Eurasia that they were blowing ever more powerful hydrogen bombs. Uh, and so they were trying to convince everyone they had won the war. They were trying to convince everyone that uh, it was the bomb power that did it, that we bombed Japan and therefore forced them to surrender and therefore the power is the bomb and we have the power. And therefore, uh, you know, it's a self-reinforcing fantasy. Well, what happened was a Japanese scientist named Katsuko Saruhashi, who was female, uh, basically proved that what they were doing would end with the annihilation of all mankind because all of the radiation was being absorbed in the ocean. She was someone who, like... Emperor Hirohito studied the sea, and she was the first woman to receive a PhD in chemistry in Japan. Her work focused on measuring the molecules in seawater, like carbon dioxide, oxygen, and also radioactive molecules like cesium-137. Now, just 12 years before she received her PhD, but she was already a scientist during wartime the United States had dropped the atomic bombs. And after that, they released a torrent of bombs via nuclear testing throughout the Pacific. Now, the only way the Americans are aware of this is because they see Godzilla movies. <laughs> and they say, yeah, that's how Godzilla was made. And then they see, uh, oh, yeah, that's why they bring in the Japanese guy. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is, this is so awful in the monster verse that they've produced. The Japanese guy takes the place of Raymond Burr, who was the gay white guy who starred in the television series Ironside. By the way, I'm not being just, you know, just insulting him here or, or, or making light of him. The guy was actually gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he... He was in the television series Ironside and uh, he played a guy in a wheelchair and he was a detective and they brought him into the Godzilla film so that they could make Godzilla accessible to Americans in the first Godzilla film. Since Americans started making the Godzilla films with the MonsterVerse, they had to bring in a Japanese guy to replace Raymond Burr to kind of make the film accessible to the Japanese so he could actually pronounce the name in the Japanese language. We call him Gojira and uh, that sort of thing. So the Japanese could say, oh, and now I know what he's talking about because none of them could recognize the new American Godzilla because the new American Godzilla was fat. And that I always joke that he was fat so they could fit a white guy in the suit. But, you know, it's CGI, so that's just a joke. But at any rate, the, so think Godzilla time and the Americans were doing all this stuff. Of course, your average American, when asked, why did the Americans stop? You're, they're going to say Godzilla, right? No, it wasn't Godzilla. Uh, the reason that the Americans and the Soviets and the British and the French and everybody stopped 
testing nuclear weapons on the surface of the earth was because of this wonderful individual, uh, Katsuko. And uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, Japanese uh, scientist, uh, Katsuko, uh, Katsuko, excuse me, Saruhashi, uh, Saruhashi basically used her expertise to prove that uh, all of these molecules were rapidly changing in the ocean due to all of these nuclear tests, no matter where they were taking place, but particularly the American above ground nuclear tests throughout the Pacific. Uh, she was able to prove that it was polluting the ocean and that it would ultimately destroy our environment. The Pacific Ocean is, of course, the largest ocean in the world. Uh, and so when it comes to damaging the uh, Pacific Ocean with, with contamination, uh, by 1958, the United States had exploded 67 nuclear devices around the Marshall Islands alone. And that's when several Japanese fishermen became mysteriously ill while trawling downwind of the testing site in March of 1954. Bear in mind, this is only two years after the peace treaty went into effect. And that's when the Japanese government asked Saruhashi and her colleagues at the geochemical laboratory to investigate. Now, the amount of fallout that we're talking about is really tiny. We're talking about the vast Pacific Ocean, which is the majority of the planet Earth's surface. For those of you who don't know, it is the majority of the surface of the Earth. And when these Japanese fishermen became ill, that's, of course, when these movie producers conceptualized and ultimately produced the movie Godzilla. And this is where Americans get their impression of history. And that's all they know about World War II in the Pacific. And in your subconscious mind, this is how most Americans and, and Westerners think, oh, well, that's why they stopped the nuclear testing. I'm serious. This is really what most people subconsciously think was because of Godzilla. No, it's a result of this Japanese scientist who basically was tasked with developing more sensitive measurements. And Saruhashi and her team ultimately found that nuclear fallout does not travel evenly throughout the ocean. They tracked ocean circulation patterns using radionuclides. And these radionuclides, with them, they discovered that the currents pushed radiation contaminated waters clockwise from Bikini Atoll northwest towards Japan. And as a result, fallout levels were much higher in Japan than along the Western US. Now, these results were stunning. The radioactive fallout released in the testing had reached Japan in just 18 months. And if this testing continued, the entire Pacific Ocean would be contaminated by 1969, proving that nuclear tests, even conducted out in the middle of the ocean, seemingly in isolation, had extraordinarily dangerous consequences. But the real victim of those consequences most immediately would be the Japanese Empire. Now, 60 years on, at this point in history today, the Bikini Atoll is still unlivable. And so when the Japanese discovered this and proved it scientifically, they approached the Americans, the Soviets, and the French and the British, and they told them, you will stop. And the Allies stopped. That proves to you that Japan won the war. It's that simple. Now, of course, there's a few more details. The Americans demanded evidence. And so Saruhashi had to travel to the United States. And uh, they forced the Americans to fund a lab swap. It was the United States that was forced to pay for it. The United States Atomic Energy Force funded this lab swap. Remember that, that's an important point. The Japanese did not pay for it, the Americans were forced to. And they brought Saruhashi to Scripps Institute of Oceanography to compare the Japanese technique for measuring with the American method that was developed by the American oceanographer, Theodore Folsom, who claimed that everything was perfectly safe. And when she was in the United States, they hated the Japanese so much that she was provided no housing. 
So she took a wooden hut in the desert to live in. And while she stayed there, to prove this small Asiatic woman from what the Americans declared a defeated nation, she proved all of her calculations were accurate and the Americans were full of shit within six months. And when, within half a year, the Americans were forced to confess that Saru Hashi's method was accurate with consistent results and nothing the Americans did was worth a shit. And because she proved to the world from her little wooden hut in the American desert that her science was superior without computers, with nothing but a Japanese abacus, whereas the Americans, with all of their supercomputers, couldn't produce a goddamn thing. Then the Japanese went before the Soviet Union, the United States, the British, and the French, and they said, you will stop now. And so they went into international agreement to end all above ground nuclear testing in 1963, the year my own late sister was born. And Saru Hashi returned to Japan to become the executive director, the executrix directoress, to use the correct gender pronunciation of the geochemical laboratory in 1979. And in 1980, she became the first woman elected to the Science Council of Japan. This woman saved the world. You've never heard of her. She stopped all above ground nuclear testing that would have poisoned the Pacific, rendered all food from the Pacific inedible, would have destroyed your world, would have impacted the rest of your life. And you've never heard of her. But now you know the Japanese won the war. And there's so many other facts besides that, but that's just one of these salient points. So you have all of these realities and you can't say, oh, it's common sense. Uh, the Americans stopped this to, uh, be, to preserve themselves because it's of benefit to all humanity. You can't say that because the Americans were in total denial. They fought it every step of the way. The only reason they had to surrender was because the Japanese were in charge, not because the, the Americans, all they would have to do is cover everything up. They could have just said, oh, look, um, some crazy woman from a defeated nation is living in a cabin in the desert. Yeah, the Americans did their best to do just that. But in the end, the Japanese had more power. This is an example of soft power. Japan won the war and is not imposing itself because it had to do what it had to do in World War II. All the way up to and including the brutality to impose itself in order to force the allies to surrender. Once that was done, they imposed themselves with soft power. There was no need to apply the force they had applied in World War II because that force had always accomplished, already accomplished what they intended. That alone should bring you to a new perspective on your world. So when we come to this kind of realization, in just one among many, uh, understand we couldn't get all of this in the book, The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II. It's simply very much a 1.0, very basic. So you need to understand that when you purchase it and read it. But uh, with that and other information I'll provide through Salman Sheikh and hopefully others in the future, we're going to continue to enlighten and inform you about the world that you live in that you know nothing about. Most Americans don't even know that there's an emperor in Japan or that Japan is still an empire. Uh, Japan covers 7,000 islands. 7,000 islands fall under Japanese jurisdiction. The American military is leasing property in Japan. The American and Japanese militaries have completely different chains of command by the Japanese constitution, by order of the Japanese constitution. In other words, by dint of Japanese legality, America and the Japanese have completely different chains of command. Uh, all of this idea of Japan being de demilitarized is fantasy. This never happened. Uh, anybody can tell you there was a Japanese military throughout the 1940s and the 50s. 
you see them in the Godzilla films. <laughs> this is what you see responding to Godzilla is all these little tanks with Japanese flags, all of these little jets with the Japanese rising sun symbol. And everybody just takes that for granted and just says, oh, okay, the, the Japs are responding to Godzilla in these films. And yet here is blatant representation. It doesn't matter that they're all toys. It doesn't matter that these are miniatures that are involved on a set. All the West was made aware that the Japanese have a military, but it's in a uh, out there, bizarre enough scenario where nobody questions it. They assume it in their minds. To probably be as fantastical as Godzilla himself. Uh, this is the insanity of the American mind. Now, why in those films? Ask yourself, why wouldn't the Japanese, if they were an occupied nation, show the Americans responding to Godzilla? After all, if the Americans occupied Japan and Godzilla is attacking Japan, why aren't the Americans responding? This is part of the insanity of your own world. You never ask that question. These are questions which Americans never ask. They accept the the concept uh, instead of men wrestling in rubber suits. <laughs> this is like, uh, this is where we're at. So you live in this rubber suit world. You live in this world of rubber suit fantasy of King Kong versus Godzilla. The reality is, what does that film really mean? Well, in terms of the latest manifestation, King Kong versus Godzilla, their final battle takes place in Hong Kong. Why Hong Kong? because that's where they made all their money was off the Chinese theater releases because the communist Chinese went to go see it so they could see Hong Kong getting wiped out because they're trying to conquer Hong Kong and absorb it. That is what made it sell in communist China. It is ultimately a communist Chinese propaganda film that focuses on the destruction of Hong Kong and uh, whom the communist Chinese are trying to destroy, devastate, absorb. Uh, destroy its independence, destroy its democracy. This is what it ultimately is a wish fulfillment fantasy of. The Chinese just wish that Godzilla and King Kong and Mecha Godzilla came there and destroyed it. This is the, the ultimately its selling point in mainland China. That's what made all of its money during its, its initial release, which was in China, not in the United States. It's an American made flick, not Japanese. So just remember that. And that is the kind of fantasy world you live in, again, that you don't understand, the politics behind such films. So when it comes to this kind of uh, reality that I've just explained, understand then that uh, you're in a world that you have no comprehension of, you have been fed lies all of your life, uh, the attacks against me are endless and relentless to prevent you from learning any of this. The attacks against me are always against myself as a person. Yes. There's nothing they can say about the information I release unless they take it out of context, which is the only way they can try and attack it is to tell you some little piece of it without telling you the context. And mm -hmm. everything out of context is meaningless. The, uh, the concept of the bombs that I just explained most Americans don't understand. They had no effect on the Japanese war effort. Mm. When it comes to the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, the USBS, with emphasis on the BS for bullshit, but it really stands for United States Bombing Survey. This was conducted by the United States to try and sell strategic bombing to the public, to sell them the concept that they needed an air force. Because throughout World War II, the Americans had no air force. They had American air power in form of the Army Air Corps and the Naval Aviation Units. And uh, for those of you who don't understand, that's not an air force. There was the American Army Air Corps, which they would often refer to as air forces, aerial forces of the Army. And there was Naval Aviation Units. And, you know, for those of you who are really just sticklers for detail, you'd say there were Marine Corps aviation units, but they're entirely subsidiary to the Navy. So the whole point is that the Americans wanted an air force. They never had it in World War II, unlike every other power on Earth. All the, the Romanians had an air force, separate branch of service. The Germans had the Luftwaffe. The British had the Royal Air Force. The Italians had Eleonorica. All of these 
had a separate air force, except for the Americans would think the Japanese. The Japanese had Japanese army air forces and Japanese naval aviation. This is all the Americans know of. Now, Onishi, Admiral Onishi, who is known, and you can look this up, Onishi's name is spelled O-N-I-S-H-I. -I. There are different romanizations of it, basically that. Admiral Onishi was the father of the Kamikaze Corps. And if you look it up and verify these facts yourself, you'll find that he told Emperor Hirohito long before to establish an air force. And Emperor Hirohito did so secretly. If you ever take a look at the air power of the Japanese, you'll notice that some of their planes have that red dot. <laughs> That's the rising sun, what the Japanese call the mon, the seal of the sun. You'll notice that their red sun symbol on some of their planes has no circle around it. And others have the white circle around it, what's called a roundel. And the roundel around the red sun symbolizes which branch of service those planes belong to. Those with the white circle around it belong to Imperial Japanese naval aviation. Those with no circle around it belong to the army. Those circles that are black surrounding the red sun, which you've never seen, simply because the Americans released no photographs, are the Japanese Air Force. And those were the secret air force that helped Hirohito win his war, along with the delivery of biological weapons throughout mainland China, which he ultimately threatened the Americans with that forced them into talk down and negotiations. Now, the Americans had to hide this and were so desperate to hide this. They knew the reality would leak to the public that both Truman and afterwards Eisenhower were in constant communications with the Japanese about how to open their markets, how the Japanese would get rich off of the American surrender. For those of you who disbelieve you surrendered, look this up yourself. You'll find everything I say is true. The Americans turned over all of their World War II aircraft carriers to the Japanese so the Japanese could scrap them break them down for their metal, and turn them into cars to sell back to America. If you're driving a Toyota from, that was manufactured in the 1980s, that's made out of parts from a World War II American aircraft carrier. The only reason Americans have any World War II aircraft carriers left to convert into museums was because career sailors like my father got together and lobbied to save some of these aircraft carriers from being sold to the Japanese so they could dismantle them for scrap to sell back to Americans. That's how much you lost the goddamn war. You claim you won the war with these aircraft carriers, but you wound up surrendering them all to the Japanese to convert into cars to sell to you. And for you to live in a fantasy world where you're driving around in a former aircraft carrier that's converted into the car you use to get to work, that shows that you're not just deluded. You're batshit fucking crazy for believing you won the war. You're out of your fucking mind. This is how insane you, the world you live in is. So in order to hide this world, what... Truman and Eisenhower allowed to leak because they knew it was impossible to hide was, well, we're talking to aliens. Of course, this is what they called the Japanese, enemy aliens. When they basically corralled all Japanese Americans in World War II and they corralled them to intern them in mass concentration camps. They had every intention of ultimately exterminating them. The only reason they didn't is because the Americans lost the war and Emperor Hirohito demanded their release. That's why the peace treaty of San Francisco was signed at the Presidio military base of San Francisco where I worked 
was because Emperor Hirohito wanted it signed there because that was where the executive order had been signed into effect by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in order to intern the Japanese in America. So this was the same reason that Adolf Hitler forced the French to surrender to him in the same locomotive cabin, the same train car in which the Germans had been forced to sign the Versailles Diktat, the surrender of the peace treaty of Versailles in World War I. So when Hitler turned it around and said, now the French will surrender to us in this train cabin, that made a political point. The ability to turn history on its head the way Hitler did made him God in Germany. Emperor Hirohito simply reinforced his divinity status when he forced the Americans to sign the Japanese peace treaty, their peace treaty with Japan in Presidio, the same place where they had signed the orders for Japanese internment. So when the Americans did what they did, they called all Japanese enemy aliens. They were stripped of their citizenship. They were robbed of all their property. All of their real estate, all of their finances were stolen by the OAP, the Office of Alien Property. And the Office of Alien Property, which stole the property of all foreigners who were deemed to be enemy aliens, whether they were German or Italian or Japanese, the OAP was responsible for taking everything they had. And when it comes to the enemies of America, don't forget that Europe, as well as Japan, Germany, as well as Japan, had allies throughout Europe and Asia. You'll get the impression, completely false, that Japan fought World War II in Asia all by itself. When in reality, all the emperors of Asia united behind Japan in a united front. You can look up a man named Yuan Shikai, first name spelled Y-U-A-N. His very name in Chinese means money. You've heard of the Chinese dollar, the Yuan, traded on the international market, Y-U-A-N. This warlord, Generalissimo Wan Shikai, he became the first ethnic Chinese emperor to rule China after hundreds of years of dominations by the foreign Mongolians and Manchurians, who are not ethnically Chinese, the Mongol and Manchu dynasties. His heirs, his descendants, allied with Japan. The emperor Bao Dai of Vietnam, who fought French colonization, allied with Japan. Emperor Puyi, who was ethnically Manchurian, allied with Japan. All of these emperors of Asia, including the King of Thailand, allied with Japan. In Europe, many Axis satellite states abounded from Croatia to Bulgaria, Romania, to the Baltic littoral states of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, to massive European nations in Eastern Europe like Belarus or White Russia and Ukraine, all allied with the Third Reich. You can look up this fact yourself. Throughout the Cold War, both Belarus and Ukraine retained separate seats on the United Nations after World War II as part of the Germans forcing the Soviets into accepting a semi-autonomy for those nations that are now independent and fighting the Russians today. All of this parcel Adolf Hitler's ultimate victory in Europe, his long-term plans being realized. He himself, one of his great allies in the Balkans, was Croatia. And in terms of Nikola Tesla, 
he is one of these complicated figures in the Balkans because he was ethnically Serbian and born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he was someone who considered himself, if anything, Yugoslav. There were two Yugoslavias, the first of King Kero Georgievich. The Kero Georgievich dynasty had a monarchy of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. The Slovenes, that's the ethnicity of the wife of Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, yeah. Melania. <laughs> Melania Trump is Slovenian. She would be part of that Yugoslavia. And of course, after World War II, it was overtaken by the communists and you had the communist, socialist, federative Republic of Yugoslavia. If anything, in terms of a national identity, Yugoslavia means South Slavic. Uh, Tesla would consider himself pan-Slavic. He would consider himself pretty much just Slavic and he felt he was the property of just everyone who would accept him. But the Americans said he was Croatian so they could declare him an enemy alien. And so when they stole all of Tesla's property and ultimately he committed suicide was because they were going to stick him in a internment camp along with the Japanese. They said, we've revoked your citizenship, which was one of his proudest possessions. We're going to take everything you have and we're going to lock you up with the Japs. Well, he killed himself so that wouldn't happen. But the man who stole everything he had left in America, based on the office of alien property power that he had, was Donald Trump's uncle, Dr. John G. Trump. You can look that up. So you've got Dr. John G. Trump, an electrical engineer. The uncle of Donald Trump, working directly with the Office of Alien Property, who was ordered to invade Tesla's offices, steal everything he had, and reverse engineer it. This was the man who made all the money that Trump's family inherited based on their theft of intellectual property from Nikola Tesla. And Trump himself ends up marrying a Slovenian, Melania. This is how power is made in the United States, through theft of your foreign refugees, through your immigrants, theft from your immigrants. Whether the Japanese or Nikola Tesla, all America has is based on theft. The Japanese owned all of San Joaquin Valley, by the third generation of immigrants. When the Americans stole all of that property, it was never given back to the Japanese. On military maps in America, it was listed not as San Joaquin, it was called Jap Valley. When your white evangelical Protestants argue that the Israelis have every right to take back Palestine, then the Japanese have every right to invade California and take back the San Joaquin Valley which itself has enough productive capacity to feed well over half the world. Much of what people eat from all over the world is grown here in California. It would have been going into Japanese pockets had the Americans not stolen it all. Hirohito was simply happy to have saved their lives. He was more interested in his people at home rather than returning land to the Japanese Americans who basically fled America. The overwhelming majority of Japanese in America after release from internment camps fled to either Japan itself or the Brazilian nation. The largest uh, population of Japanese in the world outside of Japan is in Brazil. All of this was part of the pivot towards Japanese victory. So all of these people being declared enemy aliens, that was why Truman and Eisenhower would portray their talk down meetings with the Japanese in which they were agreeing to further and further surrender, surrendering their aircraft carriers, surrendering their market. They said, well, we're in contact with aliens and the aliens have such power. 
We have no ability to resist. We have to communicate with the alien, the extraterrestrials. And so you grew up in a world believing these were people from outer space. Little green man instead of little yellow man from across the Pacific. Their technology was superior to yours by far, yes. Not in the sense that you think. It was simply green technology. Technology that was biomimetic imitated nature because Hirohito was a marine biologist. All of this was beyond American comprehension. Western technology was based on the rape of nature, the destruction of nature. And for that reason, the Americans lost the war. They're fighting nature itself while fighting the Japanese. This is why the Japanese were able to take advantage of nature, the black current and the kurashiwa, the wind from Japan towards North America, which only blows in one direction to launch their thousands of balloon bombs, which set the Pacific North West aflame and would have burned it to the ground had the war continued for one more year, which was not the Japanese intent. They were simply monitoring the wind and the smoke plumes so they could tell which direction in which to release the biological weapons that forced the Americans to surrender. Having seen the battlefield effectiveness of these weapons when deployed in China. You might ask, why didn't all of China die? The Japanese kept very tight control of where they released their biological weapons and were able to contain the outbreaks they initiated very effectively by simply shooting anyone who would leave the area. This is why they were known to be so brutal. And this, of course, prevented everyone from dying. Their brutality had a reason. There was a method to their madness. They did what they did to eliminate entire Chinese armies in the field. There's no other way a small nation like Japan could defeat a nation of a billion people. This is why having defeated the Chinese forces, Chiang Kai-shek sided with the Japanese in 1945. And as a reward, he was given the island of Taiwan on which I myself was born. That is why the Nationalist Republic of China escaped the mainland and relocated to the island of Taiwan which was part of Japan for over a hundred years. Yet you never hear of any American invasion of Taiwan to take it from the Japanese. It was simply given by the Japanese to the nationalist Chinese in return for allowing the Japanese forces to stay on the mainland until the Americans signed the peace treaty and effectively surrendered. There's your World War II in a nutshell. Understand this then, while you were occupying Japan, you were fighting the Japanese just as you were fighting the Koreans while occupying Korea and fighting Vietnam while occupying, you know, fighting the Vietnamese while occupying Vietnam. This is the same pattern throughout Asia. Once you see it in that context, you can understand more of what happened in a way that is meaningful to you. Now, sometimes it might seem like I'm insulting or sometimes it might seem as if I'm being abrasive. There's no other way to wake you up this is a world in which you've been under delusion for so long that the only way you can accept the reality is to receive some shocks. This is a shock of reality. I think that I've given enough of a baseline uh, for the situation on which we're working. But you might ask yourself, okay, so say you, you, you say what you've said, Let's put that into perspective for something like Russia. Russia is obviously still at war with Japan. So now you know automatically that if Russia and Japan are still in a legal state of war, something which you can look up yourself and verify, how is it that anyone can say the Russians won the war against Japan? It obviously puts that into pr the perspective of a lie. So when you see these academics and these PhDs, these doctors, in your intelligentsia telling you it wasn't the bomb that knocked the Japanese out of the war, it was Stalin. And they're still pushing this Russian solution. This is all part of the radicalized right-wing agenda that Vladimir Putin pushes so that you now worship the Russians as the master race instead of the Israelis. This is what 
America has devolved into. And uh, until you wake up, you're going to be continued to be influenced by the Russians. They influenced America throughout World War II, where the Americans allied with Russia against Germany and Japan and paid the ultimate price for it. And uh, the idea, of course, that uh, the concentration of all forces on Germany, when the Americans said a Germany first policy in terms of their enemy objective, and uh, their desire was to wipe out the Third Reich before they quote unquote turned to Japan, this is based on the same racism that enables most Americans to rationalize the fantasy that somehow after that, the Nazis took over the surface world. And uh, the preposterous nature, however, of this kind of situation brings us to a place like Britain, where we started the conversation, where Salman Sheikh himself became all aware of me because I was dis discussing rape in Rotherham. And just so people understand what we were talking about, basically, there, there were always enough grim tidings from around the world that the news from Rotherham, which is just a faded English industrial town, was located, never made the news. But it was where at least, and this is what we know only through the reported stories, there must have been hundreds, thousands more that were never reported, but we know for a fact at least 1,400 girls, 1,400 girls, all white and working class, were raped by gangs of Pakistani men while the local authorities did nothing. So we have to place that into context, that uh, it has to have a suitable place of dishonor in our never-ending waking nightmare. But for those of you who don't remember, that was the late summer of 2014. So that means that Salman Sheikh started hearing about me way back in 2014. Yes. And, and uh, so for the sake of the victims, the attention should be paid. These girls were gang raped. They were doused with gasoline. They were assaulted in bus stations and alleyways. There was one girl in particular whose case stood out to me who was 12 years old, who brought back bags of her soiled clothes that were covered in sperm and blood as evidence to the police. And she earned nothing for her trouble except they wrote out a check to her for 140 pounds which is something like uh, a few United States dollars. That was recompense for the clothes themselves, which the police then promptly managed to incinerate. They said they lost the evidence. They simply burned the evidence. Bearing witness to this kind of horror is insufficient. You've got to learn some lessons from it. This is more than just a horror story. It's a case study in how exploitation can flourish in different cultural contexts and how insufficient any set of politically correct platitudes can be to its restraint. So when you have these 1,400 female children subjected to ceaseless sexual exploitation in Rotherham between... 1997 and 2013, when that report was writ and when I was relating it on bandwidth and Salman Sheikh first encountered myself, mm. it was exposed that these children were, many of them were younger than 11 years of age when they were raped by multiple perpetrators, abducted, trafficked to other cities in England, beaten and intimidated. And that report alone, which was commissioned by the Rotherham Borough Council, revealed that there had been three previous inquiries. But interpreted crudely, what happened in Rotherham looks like an ideological mirror image of Roman Catholicism's sex abuse scandal. The Catholic crisis vindicates a progressive critique of traditionalism because people on the liberal progressive left 
side of the political spectrum can say, here are the wages of blind faith and sexual repression. Yet on Rotherham, there was a case study in how a culture of hierarchy and obedience can give criminals free reign just as well as what happened in the Roman Catholic Church, but at the other end of the political spectrum because it was scripted to vindicate a reactionary critique of liberal multiculturalism. It was there that immigrant gangs exploited a lunatic Western tolerance, where authorities were so committed to diversity that they could not even react appropriately. Indeed, they couldn't react at all. A liberal society so open-minded that its brain and conscience had fallen out. But there's commonalities between these two scandals at either end of the political spectrum. The rate of priestly abuse was at its worst in places and eras, the 1970s above all, where traditional attitudes overlapped with a sudden wave of liberation, where deference to church authority by parents and social, well, by parents and police coexisted with a sense of moral upheaval around sexuality and sexual ethics both within seminaries and in society at large. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a play, a theatrical release, John Patrick Shanley's uh, play, which was entitled Doubt, in which a hip and with it Kennedy era priest relies on clericalism to evade accusations of child abuse. That is probably probably remains the best dramatization of that particular tangle. And in a similar fashion, what happened in Rotherham was rooted both in left-wing multiculturalism and much more old-fashioned prejudices about race and sex and class in England itself. Because the local bureaucracy, even though it was indeed too fearful of being labeled racist, too unwilling as one former member of parliament put it at the time to rock the multicultural community boat, that the rapes went unpunished, but also they went ignored, unacted upon because of Britain's own racially inflected misogyny among their police officers, who to a man thought that white girls exploited by immigrant men were tarts. Hoes, just sluts who deserved everything they got. And the crucial issue in both scandals isn't some problem that's exclusive to traditionalism or progressivism. Rather, it's the protean nature of power and exploitation, the way that very different forms of willful blindness can combine to frustrate justice. So instead of looking for ideological vindication in these histories. It's better to draw a general lesson. Show me what a culture prizes, what they value, what they put on a pedestal, and I'll tell you who's likely to get away with rape. In Catholic Boston, as Salman Sheikh himself knows, having resided there for a time, or Catholic Ireland, that meant the man robed in the vestments of the church. In Joe Paterno's pigskin mad happy valley, it meant a beloved football coach. In status conscious education obsessed Manhattan, it meant charismatic teachers at an elite private school. In my own California and Hollywood, well, in fact, in the wider culture industry, which is still the great undiscovered country of sexual exploitation, it means the famous and the talented from Roman Polanski who raped a young American girl and yet was allowed to return to these United States to open a Holocaust Memorial Museum. And the police dared not arrest him. Oh, but he survived the Holocaust. He deserves to have any young white girl he wants. After all, he's a Jew. He's a relative of the boss. He's God's own. By blood. To how about BBC's, the British Broadcasting Company's Jimmy Seville, robed in the authority of their celebrity and art. And in Rotherham, 
back to that little industrial wasteland, that post-industrial apocalyptic cesspit. It meant men whose ethnic and religious background made them seem politically untouchable, whose victims belonged to a class that both liberal and conservative elements in British society regard with, cons well, in terms of the girls, condensation and contempt simply because they're white trash to the Brits. The point is that as society changes, as what's held sacred and who's empowered shifts, so do the paths through which evil enters in, the prejudices and blind spots it exploits. So don't expect tomorrow's predators to look like yesterday's. Don't expect them to look like the figures your ideology or philosophy or faith would lead you to associate with exploitation. Expect them instead to look like the people whom you yourself would be most likely to respect, most afraid to challenge publicly, or the least eager to vilify and hate. And because your assumptions and platitudinal pieties are evil's best opportunity, and your conventional wisdom is what's most likely to condemn their victims to their fate, we have that sad and sordid history of Rotherham, where in that case, they allowed an effective foreign invasion to take white women down to the level of the sewer in safaris, as if Britain itself were a wild land, a veldt on which white girls were the trophy to be taken. All of this, is enough fodder for someone to ask, well, does that mean England lost some war to Pakistan? No, in that case, what is going on in England is what's happening here in America with your military. Whereas the British had, were so desperate to prove themselves multicultural and they were willing to sacrifice the lower classes because to the Englishman, the lower classes are less human than the foreign oriental. In America, your heroes, your priestly class, your Roman Catholic Church is the American military. And your American military says they won World War II. Your American military has child daycare centers where they were raping children for years, and until I exposed what was going on at the Presidio military base, nothing was ever done about it. When people finally listened to what I had to say, they created this military family awareness kind of program and said, oh, the military is the safest place for children now. And that, of course, is uh, best exemplified by this month, the month of April, which in case you didn't know, is the month of the military child. So here we are. It's also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Today is Confederate Memorial Day. And amid all of these confluences, I'm here with Salman Sheikh in what is, of course, the month of the military child of all things. What does that even fucking mean? If you were to look it up and you'd find out all about how uh, the U.S. military takes the best care of children, how they're all in these safe daycare centers where nobody's raping them. Well, you can thank myself for all of that. None of this would have come to pass had it not been for Douglas Dietrich releasing what was going down at West Point, what was going down at the Presidio military base to the point where they ultimately had to shut the second most important base in the United States next to the Pentagon itself completely down. This is the world you live in. For those of you who didn't know, during the days that I worked with the Department of Defense, 
with bases in West Germany and Panama and uh, Okinawa, which is not Japan, by the way. You can look up the fact that Okinawa has got its own flag, its own culture. They're ethnically different from the Japanese. The Americans have a military base there. The Okinawans have been lobbying to get rid of forever. All of these military bases have families. And because of that, they have to have daycare centers. At the time I worked with the Department of Defense, the U.S. military was responsible for caring for 100,000 children on any given day. 100,000 children in the hands of the U.S. military. Look back on when I started to expose Michael Aquino, when he had to defend himself on all of the forums of popular culture from Geraldo Rivera to Oprah Winfrey. And as a direct result of my exposing him, his being forced to defend himself and his human trafficking, his denial thereof, mm -hmm. by 1989, the United States mm -hmm. Congress passed the Military Child Care Act. That act set in motion the Department of Defense's creation of military child development centers that have since been recognized as the national standard bearers of quality for quality of care. With now almost counting all of the services, because when I said the U.S. was caring for 100,000 a day on all its bases. I was talking only the U.S. Army alone. Today, the U.S. military has 2 million military children to protect. There are 2 million children of U.S. military servicemen and women. 200,000 children in 800 centers. 3,500 family child care homes. About 40,000 employees within nine or 10 months after big units return, there's a lot more babies being born. An endless source of flesh for the meat factory back in the days of Michael Aquino. The biggest human or trafficking operation in the history of humanity. When I broke down what had happened, what do they call it now? Despite the fact that I reformed your fucking society, they call it satanic panic. That was a satanic panic. None of it ever happened. Yeah, we reformed everything. After the Presidio military base was closed down, try and think about this. Stick your thumb up in the air and your fingernail is San Francisco. Everything beneath your thumbnail is South San Francisco and the rest of the peninsula. San Francisco is congested on your thumbnail. It is the second most congested city in the United States after New York City. And well over 1,450 acres, closer to 1,500 acres. 25% of that thumbnail was the Presidio military base of San Francisco. When I forced the closure of the Presidio military base, San Francisco's economy died. Thousands of jobs were dependent on supplying those soldiers and servicemen. San Francisco would have gone bankrupt if it hadn't been for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was just starting up and it was the immigrants, the refugees from Asia that remade San Francisco. But in the interim, everyone who had lost their jobs blamed me. I was the target along with my family of death threats, bomb threats, rape threats, the rest of my life. That's why you have the cultists of the military attacking myself when we release our book. And you see, they're one-star reviews. The only way you can fight them is by purchasing the book, 
giving it the five stars it deserves to fight your military, which has done so much to create all of these damaged children who are incapable of doing anything other than joining the military when they grow up and completing the cycle of violence elsewhere in the world, raping and killing in other countries as they've been doing since World War II. Understand that until Salman Sheikh entered his five-star review, you couldn't even purchase my book. Yeah. Amazon had taken it off the purchasing list. I'll let Salman Sheikh actually tell the story there. Yes, Brother Douglas. Uh, last night I tried to purchase your book, and I myself am somebody who's a published author on Amazon, so I know that the rules of Amazon is if your ratings go down a certain percentage, they take your uh, book, ebook, or paperback off the market. And I saw because of Richard K. Cole's uh, one star uh, review, uh, they had taken it off because one was from Aaron, which was a five star, and the other one was from him. So with two reviews with the mathematical percentage, you had gone down under 50%. So they took off your book off the market. So I tried to purchase your book. I was confused, like what's going on? And it only allowed me to read the sample version of it, which was great. And I wanted to purchase the full version so I could read it. And I realized, oh, that's what was going on. So I reported Richard K. Cole's review. I put up my five-star review. And uh, there you go. Now you're able to purchase the book because now the percentage is evened out. So any, any of my viewers that are listening, search the Roswell deception on Amazon. Report Richard's comment, which is disgusting because he's a disgusting human being. Purchase Douglas's book and leave him a five-star review because he needs our support and he's our brother. Thank you. I deeply appreciate that. I deeply appreciate what you've done. And remember, it's not for me that you're doing this. It's for the truth. Yes. It's also a struggle against those forces of darkness, which Islam, Christianity, and true practitioners of any faith are struggling against. Mm. Richard K. Cole Jr. is someone who never even completed a full tour of duty in the United States Marine Corps. He never saw a day of combat action. He was someone who was engaged in production of child pornography with the Marines that, that he was supposed to have sex with me because of the time I spent in the Marine Corps. And whereas, as you'll read in the book, the Marine Corps has an infamous history behind it. It's being a Marine is nothing to be proud of. And, uh, and that's just, again, the tip of the iceberg. When it came to something like the invasion of Okinawa, 80% of the invading force died on the beaches. 80% of them never made it onto the island. You can imagine what it would have been like for the Americans if they had tried to invade Japan itself, which they never even attempted. What you have in the case of someone like Richard K. Cole Jr. is the fact that many American militaries developed their own mafias. And when it came to the mafia of the US Army, people might remember there was a man named Robin Moore and his name's very common. So you have to look up Robin Moore in conjunction with the Green Berets. Mm. But those of you who remember the old John Wayne movie, The Green Berets, which had an enormous amount of problems behind it, you can look up the production hell that that film went through with John Wayne and uh, you now a wonderful actor. Uh, I think his name was uh, uh, Jan Vincent or something like that. He was acting right next to John Wayne in that film. He was portraying the investigative journalist, the reporter, and he was portrayed as this liberal left wing kind of reporter for the purpose of dramatic effect. Uh, in other words, he was not embedded. He was supposed to be a hostile uh, reporter. And uh, throughout the film, he becomes uh, a Green Beret himself in the sense that he goes through the same training and ultimately uh, develops a, a, a bonding with them, camaraderie, uh, his sense of camaraderie. His name was David Jansen. So David Jansen was in that role. And uh, so if you ever take a look at that film, then you, uh, you, you might understand if you trace the history of the film that was based on a book that was written in the year before I was born. 
I was born in 1966. The book about the Green Berets that film was based upon was published in 1965. And that was published by Robin Moore. His surname spelled M-O-O-R-E and uh, first name Robin. And Robin Moore published that book as nonfiction. Now, what's interesting is if you look it up in Wikipedia, they're going to say that that book was a novel, which is just absolutely bizarre. That book was nonfiction and Robin Moore was no hostile reporter. He was a, an embedded journalist. He went through all the training that the Green Berets did. He was an embedded reporter. He was very much on their side from the beginning. But the point was that Robin Moore himself later changed to become more like the character in the movie was at the beginning of the film. <laughs> he actually changed his entire political outlook about the military after experiencing the Vietnam War and the reason why he did this was because he became more and more uh, aware of Michael Aquino, who was serving in the United States Green Berets, along with men like Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez, who was the uncle of Richard Ramirez, the California serial killer known as the Night Stalker. Mm -hmm. These men were both U.S. Army Green Berets. And so what the author Robin Moore realized was that if he wrote a real book about this phenomenon, he was going to die. These men were going to kill him. So he wrote a novel called The Khaki Mafia. So The Khaki Mafia was all about the U.S. Army Mafia, but he didn't dare talk about the Satanism or the serial killing in the field. He instead talked about the fact that they were the only thing he realized that would be taken seriously that might be acted upon was to reveal the fact that they were exploiting American soldiers to smuggle opium back to the United States. In other words, EM or the enlisted men, EM is an acronym for enlisted men. The EM uh, master sergeant, Wooldridge, was in charge of all of the EM clubs throughout Vietnam. These are enlisted men's clubs where the non-commissioned officers, men from privates to the sergeant status would go so they could drink, uh, party, uh, gamble, and enjoy prostitutes. Now, when a woman is willing to sell her body for money, she'll sell information for money just as easily. Mm -hmm. So wherever the EM clubs were established, mm -hmm. the prostitutes would sell all of the information that they picked up from the guys they were fucking and sell it to the communists. And whenever these EM clubs were placed near the front, one of them was established to support the troops, then the communists automatically knew this is where the US Army was advancing. So here you've got this man running the EM clubs, Master Sergeant Wooldridge, and he's getting all his own men killed by just setting up the EM clubs that would point out their position. And getting all the prostitutes, all the information they needed to sell to the communists so the communists would know all the details. Mm. And those bodies would be gutted of all these men who got killed. They would send them home in body bags in normal passenger planes. Back in those days, you're talking about, you're talking about like United, Pan Am, TWA. They'd have bellyfuls of body bags of dead American troops flying beneath the plane where the passengers were sitting on top of them. And they would be unloaded at the other end where they landed in America by U.S. Army servicemen so they could be, you know, taken care of and delivered to their families. Mm. These men would simply open up the bodies, take out the opium that had been put in their gutted bellies, sew the stomachs back up. If they bothered to do even that, most of the time they just say, oh, part of the combat injury, part of the combat injury. Send it home to the families. This was how opium was smuggled into the United States out of Southeast Asia by the enlisted men. This was known as the Khaki Mafia. This is what Robin Moore wrote about. Now, ultimately, his book, that novel, put Master Sergeant Wooldridge, the man who ran America's EM clubs in Vietnam, that's the book that put him in jail. So Robin Moore succeeded in busting a man who was part of the Khaki Mafia, but it's kind of like not the most important part. It's like Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle. Upton Sinclair was writing about 
labor rights, about how labor was being exploited, mm. about how labor was being used as slaves to the point where people were dying of exhaustion and overwork, working day after day with no breaks, no weekends. When Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, the only message people got was, oh man, they're fucking up our meat. So he was describing how labor was being exploited, but he was talking about the meat processing, packing plants and industry. And so he wound up getting a bunch of meat and safety laws railroaded through so that people would be eating more hygienic, more safe meat based on merciful slaughter. That's part of the wheel that was turning towards the publication of his novel, The Jungle and Upton Sinclair succeeded in improving the quality of life in America, but it didn't address the real issue of the book, which was labor standards. Mm -hmm. So the khaki mafia took care of one problem, but not the problem, which is the army itself. So Robin Moore succeeded in getting one man landed in jail, but he didn't succeed in people understanding the economy of the military mafia. So while the U.S. Army had basically cornered uh, the market of drug smuggling, and then the CIA with U.S. Air Force General, General Secord, who was later involved in the Iran-Contra scandal, running Air America, the largest civilian airline is in the world, was the CIA airlines. You put all the civilian airlines together, TWA, Pan Am, all the rest of them on earth together, Southwest, Alaska Airlines, they came up to just a fraction of the CIA air fleet, Air America, at the time of the Vietnam War. That's how much drugs they were smuggling out of Vietnam. Bringing all that back. With all of this heavy duty, multi-billion dollar profit industry that was cornered by the US Army and their former Air Corps, the Air Force, along with the CIA, the Marines were left with nothing. So what they specialized in was gay porn. Because the Marines have San Diego Marine Corps Recruit Depot right across the border from Mexico. And just recently, you can look this up, there was a bunch of Marines smuggling kids across the border. And then when their own Marine Corps tried to bust them, none of them spent a day in jail. They all said, oh, they were arrested in such a manner in front of their comrades that they were embarrassed. So we have to let them all go. This is the military mafia where they grade their own homework. You can look that up about the Marines, human trafficking, how none of them met any justice, how they all were released, that all the evidence brought against them was dismissed. This has been going on forever. And the reason the human trafficking is involved is a lot of these kids are brought over to film child porn. Now, I've related before how basically the Marine Corps was in its boot camp, torturing anyone they didn't consider American to the point where many of these people killed themselves. Mm. Ultimately, many people were uh, forced to face justice for that. But the reality was very few did in context or comparison to the depth of the problem. And it got to the point where the Marine Corps had to issue special instructions, please don't perform pornography wearing your uniform or don't show off your Marine Corps tattoos. People can look this up. These orders are out there, general orders to the Marine Corps because they can't stop the porn. So the only thing that they can do is try to contain it to a degree where not everybody realizes how much gay porn is dominated by the Marine Corps. So uh, when it comes to this kind of phenomenon, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was given what are called illegal orders. And uh, this was, of course, uh, orders where I was supposed to rendezvous with a man named Richard K. Cole Jr. to film a pornographic film because I was considered very attractive and Asian and a feat. I spoke with him once on the telephone because I was supposed to rendezvous with him. After that, everything went down 
that anybody who's familiar with my case would know where I was in the House of Saud and wound up in prison for killing two police officers and was headed for execution in the House of Saud itself, beheading specifically. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I owe the Marine Corps for pulling me out of that situation. Uh, they busted myself down by a rank from Lance Corporal to Corporal. After I served in Operation Desert Storm, they simply relieved me of duty uh, in what is called a kangaroo court martial. It was quiet and um, they did me a favor by getting me out of service. And for that reason, I escaped rendezvousing in San Diego with Richard K. Cole Jr. to film a gay pornographic film. The end result was that he's hated me for life and he's never forgiven me. And he represents, of course, those elements of the American military that are consistently trying to deny everything from their crimes against humanity regarding human trafficking, satanic ritual abuse, to the fact that they lost the Second World War. Yes. Now, um, by the way, are, are you in need of doing something? I, uh, I, I mean, how, how's, how are you for time? Uh, I was just checking in because, of course, uh, uh, I thought I saw you communicating with someone off camera. Maybe I was mistaken in that. Or are you just kind of checking your environment? Just... Oh, just, just checking my environment. You, you do what you need to do, my brother, because your message is important. Take all the time that you need to explain oh, no, everything. No, no worries. We've got, we've got plenty of time ahead of us in future interviews. And uh, I do want you to appear on my show as well in return. And uh, understand, everyone, that... Uh, our man uh, Salman Sheikh is a, uh, a, a brother in battle. He is uh, definitely going to be appearing as part of Team Dietrich on my programs whenever he can spare the time. And uh, in terms of what we're explaining here, this is important because it's the name you're going to be seeing, uh, except for other names he takes up as aliases Richard K. Cole Jr. I'm explaining the context in which his attack is coming from, which is both personal as well as cultic. Uh, he is um, what Michael Aquino called a hitcher. So if people want to understand the psychodynamics behind this, there is a film starring Rucker Hauer that is called The Hitcher. And it's a very specific term because it's not hitchhiker. It's an interesting term in the sense that no one ever heard the term The Hitcher until that film. And what that film portrays is Rucker Hauer is acting the role of a psychotic, murderous, gay man who's homosexually enamored of a young man who he targets and he does everything to destroy this young man's life. He starts a killing spree while framing everything on this young man and he does this all as basically a homeless hitchhiker. And he's doing this following the young man, tormenting him, costing him his family. He ultimately murders the young man's girlfriend. There's no happy ending to this film. Uh, what satisfaction you gain in the end from the killing of Rutger Hauer is meaningless because the boy is considered responsible uh, for his murders uh, to a great degree and is uh, held as basically the villain by the media and uh, he's lost his girlfriend and his family and everything else. So this man accomplishes destroying this person's life. This is what Michael Aquino said he developed in Richard K. Cole Jr. He is a hitcher. So this individual's whole life is dedicated to myself. He goes on white supremacist uh, sites, which we have the evidence of because he sends them to me and uh, basically uh, tries to turn the white supremacists against me to get as many people out to kill me as possible. This is a life or death situation, but everything I've reported to the FBI, they will do nothing about it. This is of course, because I'm an Asian Pacific Islander American. Uh, understand that when it comes to the Japanese officer Yamashita, who tried to enter the Marine Corps, he never graduated from Quantico as an officer, which I knew I never would. So I entered as an enlisted man. He ultimately sued the Marine Corps and he won because he was tortured half to death and had to leave the Marine Corps. And this was because he was Asian. He ultimately won a lawsuit because he became a politician. As an attorney, he became an attorney first, then a politician. He dedicated his life to rehabilitating his name that the Marine Corps had destroyed. In my case, they try to pull the same tactic. They'll claim I was never in. All of the documents they present either don't exist or are completely fabricated. 
uh, the end result is that uh, you have a situation in which, because, let me put it to you this way, when it comes to Asian Pacific Islander American murders, you have now the U.S. government, in terms of the Democratic Party, trying to push through mm. anti-Asian hate laws. And the reason that they are forced to push through anti-Asian hate laws is because until this point in history, you could murder an Asian, whether an Asian American or an Asian foreigner, and you could get away with that murder. A lot of people simply don't understand that Asian Americans are not considered human beings by dint of the law. You have basically a situation in which it was written into uh, the Constitution of the state of California that Asian Americans were an enemy species to be eliminated because they were carriers of diseases. So when it came to this kind of mentality, that kind of law is not necessarily in the constitution of every state, but it is very much in the American cultural belief system, in its norms. So when you have these incidents where so many Asian Americans are murdered, the white men never spend mm. a day in jail, all of this sources back to that mindset. So in order to try and put this into some perspective for Americans so they can even begin to understand, you can take a look at uh, various Asian Americans who have been murdered. I believe one man's name was Anthony Chin. And let me see if I can uh, just verify Anthony Chin murder by looking that up just briefly on the web. And uh, Vincent Chin was his name. Now, Vincent Chin was a Chinese American man who was beaten to death in Detroit, Michigan by two white men who had lost their jobs in the American automobile industry because the Japanese won the Second World War. So they decided they were going to kill a Jap. They ran across Vincent Chin, who was a Chinese engineer, Chinese American, a US citizen, and they beat him to death. The Americans called them national heroes. They never spent a day in jail. Whereas Vincent Chin died screaming and crying, saying, I'm not Japanese. You had a Japanese citizen, a citizen of the Empire of Japan, who visited America, was going to a costume party, and he was shot to death in the state of Louisiana, near New Orleans, in one of the parishes, because he was asking for directions. He was dressed in his Halloween costume, which was not even a particularly offensive costume or a scary monster costume. He was dressed as John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever. So he was dressed in an all white dance outfit. And when he knocked on a man's door to ask for directions, the man shot him. And that man was considered an American hero because he had shot a Jap. He never spent a day in jail. If you look up all of these murders of Asian Pacific Islanders, American citizens or foreigners, you'll find none of their murderers have spent a day in jail. So when Richard K. Cole Jr. says he's going to kill me because he can get away with it, he's telling the truth. He can kill me and he will never spend a day in jail. I'm a United States citizen, but as an Asian American, I'm considered a foreigner no matter what. It doesn't matter that I hold US citizenship. All that matters is that I'm Asian, which in American eyes means I'm not human. So this is the level of consciousness where you're at. And the reason you're so full of hate, all of you Americans, for people like myself is because you know you lost the war. Otherwise, you wouldn't hate us so much. Otherwise, you wouldn't fear us so much. But deep down inside, you know you lost the war. And so when it comes to this fact, this is why I have to educate the public about this in individual. There is a man named Richard K. Cole Jr. who was sworn to kill me. The FBI will do absolutely nothing. Everyone refuses to report him who has been threatened by him. 
that includes Peter Moon, Lena Shea, uh, my medical cosmetologist, Vanessa Ann Clark, because they're white and they don't need to. They're not in danger. They don't care. Only I'm in danger, so they feel obligated to do nothing. This is the world I live in. I'm all alone. The only reason Salman Sheikh stands by my side is not simply because he's a purveyor of truth, not simply because he's a spiritual warrior fighting against darkness. It's because he's also Asian American. Yes. He is someone from Asia himself who faces that dire threat. He will now be a target of Richard K. Cole Jr. as well. But in his case, he is not white and therefore will not take it lightly. He will stand up for himself. So this is a challenge to Richard K. Cole Jr. because this is the only way we're going to solve this problem is to have my affiliates stand up. None of them will do so who are white or black. He was putting up pictures of Derek Talley's children and his younger relations and Derek Talley wouldn't report him at all. The end result is this man continues to get away with everything because blacks and whites will do nothing to stop him. This man has no power on his own. He has power because everyone lets him do what he wants. This will stop here because Salman Sheikh and I will not stand down. He is someone who has decided he will stand up. He is standing by my side. Mm. So it ends here in that regard. Once there is more than one that is targeted get it someone willing to fight back this is the only thing that will stop richard k cole jr peter moon wasn't even like taking into account that the book wasn't being allowed to be purchased because of richard k cole jr uh and yet you'll notice that my biography isn't even on amazon it's only peter moon's this is what I'm stuck with. I'm in a world where I effectively do not exist. There's no one even willing to acknowledge my existence. So if I die, no one is going to know. That's the world I live in. So when you take a look at why it has taken to this point to stand with Salman Sheikh on this, this is because we stand alone. Salman yeah. Sheikh and I are doing our best to reach out. He, of course, faces his own suppression. Certainly, he has more subscribers than even what you see on YouTube. But much is done with our numbers so that the aggregates continue to operate against us. It's up to our listeners to take the stand. The way that you can help is by spreading the word. You let people know about this interview. You let people know to listen to it and review it. Mm. And that is what will help. The other thing you do is you go to purchase Salman Sheikh's book, make it known about him and the cause that he's fighting, fighting for, which is enlightenment. You purchase my book, The Roswell Deception, and you place a five-star review there so that you can fight the forces of darkness thereby. Yes. When it comes to what I knocked down at the... San Diego Marine Corps Recruit Depot and uh, the Camp Pendleton. We were dealing in that point with uh, the entire homosexual gay porn ring that was dominating the lives of Marines. And uh, what I approached once I was out of the Marine Corps was their wives, what few wives there were. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, about the Camp Pendleton scan scandal concerning uh, the uh, gay porn uh, and the human trafficking. Understand that uh, the Marines are basically surrounded by opportunities hmm. to make money by prostituting themselves to the point where the commandant of the Marine Corps at around the time that I was in and shortly thereafter, this was during the Clinton administration. He tried to eliminate all married men from entering the Marine Corps. So basically, you know, you can read about this by taking a look at Sergeant Matthew W. Sims Simmons. Uh, surname was like Richard Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S. 
he took active duty leave from the Marine Corps band to go star in some gay porno movies. His stage name was Christian Jade or simply Adam. He wound up with a co-author, the co-author being Rich Merritt, writing a book, The Secrets of a Gay Marine Porn Star. Then you'll find out a little bit more about uh, gay marine porn. There was a Marine busted uh, in a Homeland Security state online. He was Stephen Lewis of California, who was arrested after basically he was having sex with so many children that he began to proposition parents so that they would bring their children to him to fuck. And so he approached uh, men who were actually Homeland Security agents, and he'd been doing this for so long. He said, oh, uh, I want your two young children to this one Homeland Security agent who was portraying himself as just a regular dad. He said, you know, you bring him over where I can have sex with him and we can film it and I'll give you money. And it was the Marine Corps that gave him the budget. When the Homeland Security busted him, they can't bust the entire Marine Corps, so they can only take him down one at a time. But you know what he offered, uh, aside from sex, to the underage children of a man he didn't know? He brought, by the time they rendezvoused with him, he brought a bunch of Marine Corps t-shirts to give the children child-sized Marine Corps t-shirts so that they could remember their experience. Now, those children didn't exist in this case because the Homeland Security was simply fronting these false virtual personas so they could catch this guy. But this is the depth of what we're talking about. And Stephen Lewis was a private first class stationed at Camp Pendleton, California. He was arrested on September 14th in 2013 in Morgan Hill, California, about a year before Mr. Salman Sheikh had even heard of me. Mm. Now, the person who was running the Marine Corps gay porn ring was a guy named Sabalos, Chebalos, C-E-B-A-L-L-O-S. He was a legal immigrant from Mexico, legal, but uh, he was on parole all the while that he was operating a active duty gay marine porno production ring that involved well over half a thousand active duty personnel. At the time, I took down his operation in 1993 after I got out of the Marine Corps myself. And he was like paying Marines active duty Marines up to around $250 for taping sessions that ranged from 20 to 90 minutes in the San Diego area. All of this was part of a human trafficking program in which uh, kids were brought from across the border, promised citizenship, and then they found, wound up fucking Marines and then uh, what would happen is they would be sent back over the border or turned over to ICE, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, where they would be locked in prison until they were deported. So the Marines had a thing going on with Border Patrol. When I approached what few wives there were and said, I knew what all of their situations would be because these Marines marry only to make it look like they're straight when they're all gay. I said, you know why your husband never has sex with you? I said, no, why? And I said, because he's part of this gay production ring. When I approached enough wives and they got together and complained, that's how we took the whole ring down. That's how Richard K. Cole Jr. lost his job. That's exactly why he hates me so much. This gives people context with what we're dealing with. So hopefully people understand this in the context that is real. This is the context that uh, we're confronted with. For those of you who don't know, when I was a Department of Defense Research Librarian, I was ordered to work with the satanic chaplain of the US military, Michael Aquino, and I need to qualify that. You can look this up and verify it yourself. Michael Aquino, who people understand just by looking his name up, was a Satanist and a human trafficker. He wrote the chaplain's handbook for the US military, not just the army, which he was a part of, but all branches of service. Navy, Air Force, Marines. 
the chaplain's handbook was written by Michael Aquino. And that's so he can specify that all conventional chaplains, Catholics, Protestants, Jewish rabbis, even Muslim imams are ordered to step back and stand down whenever a satanic chaplain shows up. And the satanic chaplain supersedes the jurisdiction of all conventional chaplains in the U.S. military. All branches of service, the unofficial religion of all the U.S. armed force branches of service is Satanism. You can see this in its fruition in a documentary you can easily find on YouTube called The Dark Side of Aldura. They spell it in the American romanization from the Arabic as A-L space D-O-U-R-A. The Dura. And the dark side of Aldura opens with Dick Cheney himself saying, we must go to the dark side. We must go to the dark side. And it chronicles the experience of a poor U.S. Army Ranger joining one of the U.S. Army elites. So I can educate people a little bit as to how the armed forces special operations units in the Army originally were established. You hear about the U.S. Navy SEALs. You hear about uh, various special forces units with various branches of service. But the Army has more than one. And uh, there are the Green Berets, which are the special forces. And then there were the U.S. Army Rangers. The Marine Corps equivalent would be LERP, or Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. But why does the Army have two, you might ask? That's because Michael Aquino was one of the men who helped to establish the U.S. Army Green Berets. He was one of the first Green Berets. That's a fact. Mm. And when it comes to the U.S. Army Green Berets, they convinced John F. Kennedy that they needed a counterinsurgency. In other words, an insurgency force that would act opposite of the communist insurgency throughout Southeast Asia at the time. So the idea of the Green Berets was based on John F. Kennedy's own Peace Corps. That's how they convinced John F. Kennedy. They said, look, you established the Peace Corps to help improve the quality of life all around the world so you can prove that Americans are not the bad guys. Let's conduct a military equivalent. Let's establish a military equivalent that's an armed Peace Corps. So the whole idea behind the original Green Berets, their original mission statement, their original objective, which you see to degree in the John Wayne film, is that they're really there to provide vaccinations, uh, dig sewers, uh, provide latrines and healthy living to tribal peoples behind enemy lines in communist territory. Their idea is to work with a friendly population resisting the communists who have taken over their part of the country and in turn train those people to fight the communists. Their job is to avoid combat at all costs themselves. Uh, and if something happens where they are suddenly find themselves in combat, that means everything has gone wrong. Now, of course, this mission statement changed. It, it, it fell victim to what's called mission creep. And that means they became combat units after America became increasingly desperate. Then you had more and more Green Berets committed to combat because they couldn't train enough friendly populations behind enemy lines. So the end result was a complete perversion of the original mission statement, and they were only able to get away with this after Kennedy was killed. So then they became combat units, which was never the intention. You can look that up yourself. It's all true. Now, when it came to the real combat units the Army originally had for that purpose, those were the U.S. Army Rangers. And unlike the Green Berets, they wore Black Berets. So the original Black Berets were the U.S. Army assassination units. The U.S. Army Rangers produced snipers and assassins to kill the enemy behind enemy lines. That was the purpose of the U.S. Army Rangers. They were supposed to do what the Green Berets could not. So when this person in the dark side of Aldora, the subject of the documentary named John Needham, his surname was spelled N E E D H A M, John Needham joined the U.S. Army Rangers, he was in the same position as that Patrick Tillman, the NFL man 
who the football player with the National Football League who gave up, sacrificed a multi-million dollar contract to become a U.S. Army Ranger after 9-11. That man was like John Needham. These were like golden boys. And these innocent white boys, these golden boys had no idea what they were getting into. And when they entered the U.S. Army Rangers, they wanted to fight the enemy and, and uh, bring honor to America. And they wind up in the company of all these rabid baby rape and Satanists. So you see in the dark side of Aldura, John Needham go literally insane. He's turning in photographic evidence of atrocities to his superiors. And in return, they lock him up in the middle of the desert heat in metal containers storage lockers so his skin burned off his body covered him in blisters before they splashed him with salt water tortured him to the point of insanity and sent him home by the time he came home he was just a train wreck and he was so insane that his girlfriend who was a u.s army nurse broke up with him because she knew he was going to kill her he wound up with a foreign girlfriend, an ethnic girlfriend who I believe was Latina, and he killed her. He was so insane, the judge said, I can't put this man in prison. And he simply sent him back to his father and told his father, take care of him. Where his father was walking along the beach with him when one day he just dropped dead like somebody pressed a button. Of course, Aquino had been experimenting with long range assassination for decades. That's almost certainly what that was. It would require more explaining in terms of the occult technique, but we don't need to go into that now. If you watch The Dark Side of Aldura, you'll see the photographic evidence of men whose faces have been scalped from their heads. And they're continually breaking open young boys' skulls so they can eat the brains. You'll see the photographic evidence of the satanic chaplains of the U.S. Army Rangers taking the brains out of young boys' heads and passing them around for the soldiers to bite. That's the satanic consecration. This is the legacy of Michael Aquino. He may be dead, but his satanic cultists carry on. It's amazing to me when I receive emails from people saying, what's your evidence that they're eating the brains? You see right there in the dark side of Aldura, the photographs of them cracking open young boys' skulls, never girls, because they don't want the estrogen. They want only the testosterone from the boys. And you see them removing the brains. This is obviously for that reason. There's no surgical or medical reason to be doing that by any stretch of human illogic. So this is what John Needham was confronting that drove him mad, what Patrick Tillman confronted to the point where they had to kill him. And yes, Patrick Tillman was killed by his own men. The forensics pathologists prove that. This is your military, and your military is your enemy. Understand this, your biggest enemy in the world is the United States military. They are your enemy if you're an American. They wear their flags backwards ever since I proved the fact that on the... USS Battleship, the Missouri, where the so-called surrender ceremony took place, a circus event in which Emperor Hirohito was not only not present at all, he held such contempt for it, it was held because Truman begged him, I need something to show the public so that they'll think I won the war if we're to surrender our economy to you. And Hirohito just said, go for it. None of the Japanese who showed up on that ship even have any samurai swords to surrender to the Americans. And the Americans have a backwards flag, backwards and upside down. Instead of the 13 original colonies, it's a satanic transposition of 31 stars, 31 as opposed to 13, an inversion of the original numbers. And they're all upside down, sigils of Baphomet. That flag, of course, is on the bulkhead of that ship for the very reason that it's a false ceremony. The whole thing is a lie. And it was how the Japanese brought home the message that they had won the war because that was the original flag, a false flag that was given to Commodore Perry when he invaded Japan and forced them to open their culture to the West. And that flag was a false flag provided to Commodore Perry 
because Commodore Perry was essentially to be portrayed if he were captured or caught by the British or any other European power while he was trying to open up Japan for American trade. If he were to be defeated by a foreign fleet, that false flag was there so the Americans could declare him a renegade admiral in charge of a rogue pirate fleet. Mm. That way they could sacrifice him and avoid war. Don't forget that it happened after the War of 1812 when the Americans had been defeated by the British and the Canadians had invaded America and set the capital on fire and burned down the White House. Right. So in the after effect of having lost a major war, the Americans were very afraid of European powers. Commodore Perry had a false flag in which to surrender himself were he captured so that America would not be involved or implicated. And when he opened uh, Japan under that false flag and they realized later on that they had been opening their country under false pretenses, under force of invasion, under rule of force, they in turn forced the Americans to bring that flag back on the USS battleship Missouri so that the Americans would show themselves as having lost the war. That is, again, ultimate proof in your eyes that you are not even aware of. So when the Americans had that little ceremony and claimed that was their surrender ceremony, you'll notice that the Chinese are not present as signatories. And that's because China had switched sides to Japan. The Soviet Union did not sign that. Uh, were, they were still legally at war with Japan, and now the Russians are still legally at war with Japan today. This is the world you live in, and the world you live in is incredibly impacted by World War II every day. Your world is still at war with the Third Reich, the Western world. The man who has taken it upon himself to produce some documentaries on his channel, uh, Bizarre HD channel on YouTube, you would look that up by looking up B-I-Z-A-R-E-H-D, is George Knight, who lives in England. And George Knight, of course, has produced several videos on the, based on my expositions, how the United States is still legal at war with the Third Reich in exile. This is why we're still on Daylight Savings Time. You can look this up yourself. Daylight Savings Time never existed in the United States until World War I. It was impugned upon the American public for a single year in World War I. Everyone demanded it be withdrawn. When FDR got onto a war footing and mobilized America for a second world war, he put everybody back on wartime, and we've been on wartime ever since. Russia, on the other hand, has declared peace with the Thousand-Year Reich in exile, and they are off daylight saving. So the Russians have remove daylight savings from their lives. Uh, they're at peace with the Third Reich in exile, whereas the Americans and the British are still legally at war with the Thousand Year Reich in exile. And um, therefore, we're still on daylight saving time, war time. You can look that up. As for the phone tax, uh, George Knight may very well end up working for the phone companies or the telecommunications uh, departments of the British Empire, uh, the British government. And uh, one thing that he's chronically aware of is both in England and in the United States, you can look at any of your phone bills and you will see a wartime tax. There is a telephone tax, a federal tax on all your phone bills that is, you can look it up, a wartime tax. And this was started in World War II because they wanted to discourage people from making unneeded and unnecessary phone calls during wartime because in those days you had young ladies who worked at a switchboard or old ladies for that matter and these women would literally have to plug in the socket to connect you and it would overwhelm them if everybody was calling home so to discourage that they instituted a telephone tax today that telephone tax is still in effect and it is a wartime tax you are legally in a state of war with the Thousand Year Reich in exile. This is one reason, aside from the fact that the Japanese having won World War II in the Pacific and demanded that America never declare war again. You see, the myth you hear is just the opposite. You hear, yes, we forced the Japanese to forswear war forever. 
but it's the Americans who have never been able to declare a war since World War II. Since World War II, America has never been able to legally declare a state of war. Two reasons for this, one on the Japanese side, the Japanese demand it, they dismiss, dismantle, uh, completely deconstruct their war department. Now, remember, you can look this up. The United States used to, there was no Department of Defense. The United States used to have a Department of War. An honest to God Department of War, that's gone. The Japanese said, you will never wage war again. You will dismantle that Department of War. And the Americans had to dismantle that in 1947 while undergoing peace talks with the Japanese and surrendering to their demands. And that's when they had to reestablish a Department of Defense. The Japanese allow Americans a defense force. This is what the Americans say about the Japanese. You know, the Japanese don't have a military. They've got um, a defense force. They've got defense forces. Well, that's exactly what America has, defense forces. And uh, so the Japanese imposed this on the Americans following the Japanese model. And so the Japanese made certain the Americans can never declare war again. They no longer have a department of war. They cannot legally uh, declare war. So every war America is involved in is illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, but it cannot declare war again because first it lost to Japan and secondly, it's still legally at war with the thousand year Reich in exile. So these are various things that need to be emphasized. It is now close to three o'clock here. We started at 12 noon. So it's close to 6 p.m. where Salman Sheikh is at. We'll start closing um, the interview down very soon. We're gonna take just a few minutes to um, go over some things. I, I want to make certain that Salman Sheikh emphasizes the title of his book so that uh, listeners know where to go for that as well. So uh, we will promote that um, side by side with the Roswell deception. So Salman Sheikh, explain to us a bit about the book you wrote and what uh, importance and significance it has for yourself and everyone else who wishes to in investigate it. Yes, my brother. Uh, the name of my book is The Spiritual Reflections of the Sufi Freemason, Volume 1, which is available on Amazon, both in e-book um, e and paperback format. And the reason why I wrote this book is because I, re I realize even in the, um, you know, the fields that I'm involved in, no one is willing to share the actual truth on many esoteric and spiritual matters. I have many um, Freemasons and other spiritual paths and other people that email me saying that the information that you're teaching me, no one else is teaching us. So I'm basically a mirror reflection of you, my brother. And even in this book, uh, this is basically a Masonic book, and I'm talking about Sufism and Islam and how to protect yourself against Satanists and how to defeat handlers. Like, there's no Masonic book that's going to talk about this type of stuff that I'm talking about, which is to share the, uh, you know, to also change the hearts and minds of the people because people think that all Muslims or Freemasons are evil, which is not true. Or people, uh, you know, have a misconception that all you know, the different species that exist on this uh, earth are evil. That's not true, my brother. The fight between good and evil, light and dark, exists in all nations, groups, races, religions, and species of this planet. And I have a promise to Almighty God that I have to make peace, whether those species are human, non-human, and to leave this world in a better condition in which I inherited it as an almost 29-year-old man. So that's, that's my purpose. And, you know, with what you're doing, I stand with you. And you need to um, let the people know who you are and what you're trying to tell humanity, because you, you, you and I are mirror reflections of one another. As in Islam, it says, one of the 99 names of Allah is Allah Hud. Everything is one. Whether it's me as a human being, anyone else that's not human, you and I come from the same source. And the sooner people realize that, the sooner we'll have peace on this planet, my brother. God bless you. And uh, Allah be praised. And uh, peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad, who was his messenger, and uh, still is through the holy work of the Quran. I want to thank you so much for reminding me that I have a second book out there uh, published uh, by Peter Moon and myself, this is not on Amazon. You simply need to look up Douglas Dietrich Vampirology, and it's spelled V-A-M-P-H-Y-R-O-L-O-G-Y. Vampirology, vampire being the correct European 
uh, pronunciation and mm. uh, in romanization from the Cyrillic for the vampire species. And our man, Salman Sheikh, is very kind by including that uh, subspecies of humanity in what he is speaking of because he understands that just as there are wolves and there are sheep and just as there are sharks and there are minnows, there are predators on the food chain and there are other uh, creatures within their same species that serve as their prey, but is part of the balance of nature. Yes. And the balance of nature is all of God. And so in that sense, what I introduce to people based on the original uh, Soviet research into the reality of the Vampire subspecies is what I can in terms of their medical physiology. This book is by no means complete. Like the Roswell deception itself, it's very much a 1.0. We had to get it out immediately in both cases, simply because everything was operating against us. Uh, when Peter Moon returned from Washington, District of Columbia, his computer was crashed. There was no coincidence here. The, your computer, no computer just crashes like that with the entire disk corrupted and everything compromised. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so he just comes home and, oh yeah, the computer is crashed. And, you know, at that point, um, Crystal River convinced me we had to get the book out or it wasn't going to be published at all, even though there was much I wanted to add into the Roswell deception. Bear in mind, while you're reading it, that it is very much uh, rendered by Peter Moon, quite understandably, for accessibility. So without Peter Moon, I could never have done that. And so Peter Moon is the man responsible for making it accessible to the general public. In that sense, he's making, he is the interpreter from the technical language I would otherwise use that, would, that has always made my information inaccessible to the general public and uh, therefore easier to dismiss because nobody understood it. And he took it out of the professional realm and made it popularly accessible. So all credit to him. It's in that spirit. What we've released about vampirology is very incomplete. People are lacking uh, a lot of the historical context for these investigations. We will re-release the book in the near future uh, that will cover that. But uh, in the interim, what people have is at least the physiological reality of vampirism. And of course, uh, I want people to understand that uh, this is going to sound um, in incredibly shallow, but vampire or vampires are people too. Uh, <laughs> and the biggest problem that people have is that uh, unfortunately, thanks to movies, thanks to films and thanks to popular culture, people, well, they think of them as something else. They think of them as a hyper-romanticized, they have a hyper-romanticized image, and hopefully this book will do its bit to put that out of, uh, a, 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 out of your mind and help you adapt to a kind of uh, realistic uh, acceptance that there are those among us who are not like us. This is not what people think. It is not maskarova or a masquerade, as the Russians would call it, in the sense of uh, people who are more intelligent than you and preying upon you, who are a superior species in the sense of being uh, intellectually uh, the way you portray the cultivated European gentleman that we got out of Hollywood. This is uh, basically, these are simply a subspecies of humanity who are trying to survive. And really it's very similar to in their function to in autistic children, really. It, they're very much like autistic children, no matter how old they are. That would be the norm. And uh, there are certain people who have less of that bloodline in them who are um, a bit uh, diluted, that are a bit more human in terms of their processing and cognizance. Um, but most um, of them there would be just this side of homelessness, just the side of, uh, uh, of uh, autistic children functioning at a level of processing that is not considered uh, professionally on par with employment. Uh, so th this is something to bear in mind. And it's something that uh, uh, is, is not comprehended by most people. And this can differ with cultures, with cultures that have integrated this subspecies. Uh, their, their processing is much more different, but that's the equivalent of cultures that have taken autistic children and worked with them and therefore is able to get out of them 
something in terms of their performance the way the Americans got what they did out of Thomas Alva Edison, who was autistic. In fact, the autistic gene is known as the Edison gene. There is a book by that title. So it's not that Vampire, like Thomas Alva Edison, can, under circumstances, rise above what is normally a uh, condition that is going to prohibit them from excelling and rise above that to the point where they do. But uh, it's also important not to view this as a condition. And this is what we have been trying to do when we try to normalize autism. We normalize it by saying um, that, you know, and there's controversy about this. There are people who say, stop thinking of autism as a gift. But um, uh, it's simply something that is. And for whatever reason, we have a lot of it. And of course, some people blame uh, vaccines without taking us down that road. Of course, that's a different controversy. But um, again, in the book, The Roswell Deception, I speak a lot about vaccines. So do understand this much. Uh, I uh, emphasize the fact that the Americans uh, vaccinated four and a half divisions of their own men out of serviceability during World War II in a direct response to the Battle of Los Angeles. So you can read about the largest single point source of hepatitis in the history of humanity result in the Battle of Los Angeles. This can go to show you just how negative vaccines can be in terms of their impact. That cost the Americans the war. That was one of the many factors that did. That was the Stalingrad or Leningrad of the Pacific was the Battle of Los Angeles because that resulted in wiping out four and a half American divisions that they couldn't deploy into the Pacific thereafter and depriving all of that manpower, they had to rely on the Australians who have a population uh, comparative to the United States of almost nothing. So this is uh, something you'll read about in the Roswell Deception. We count on you and your, or your five-star reviews to keep it in publication and to fight the darkness. And check out Vampirology by looking up Douglas Dietrich Vampirology, V-A-M-P-H-Y-R- O-L-O-G-Y. And uh, my love be unto Solid Shake for enabling us through these three hours. God bless you, my son. I love you beyond expression. I will call you privately, um, uh, if not this weekend, then uh, hopefully before Wednesday, maybe on Tuesday or, um, or on Thursday uh, or Friday. One of these days, very soon, I'll give you a call and we'll get you on my program as well. And hopefully you'll become more of a regular and uh, people will become acquainted with you and your works because they are so important. I have referenced in our promotional banner, I have referenced Salman Sheikh as our resident Islamo chaplain. And uh, he is someone I refer to as a uh, basically a Sufi mason. And Sufi, by the way, is literally from the Arabic woolen uh, because the Sufi are the practitioners of that particular form of spirituality, which has a much more complicated Arabic name, just so people know. Sufi is more like a, almost like a colloquial. It, it really is almost more like a colloquial kind of way to reference them. It's more like wearers of wool are, yes. uh, yeah, are, are the people who, who wear wool, which of course, uh, um, Salman, if you could give us just a bit of perspective here, I want people to understand the Sufi mysticism most Westerners only know what they know primarily through Gurdjieff and uh, his explorations into this mystical branch of Islam, uh, the purest form of Islamic practice, the basic, basically the monastic form of Islamic practice. Most people know of that through Gurdjieff and he was half involved in espionage and um, you have to really take that into context. That's not the best place to learn about, about Sufism from. Rather, Salman Sheikh presents us with the reality I never even knew. When I think of Sufi and uh, the practice of mystical Islam, I think as most Westerners do of Northern Africa into Asia Minor and um, maybe Southwest Asia itself to extent, but I had no idea there were Sufi organizations and actually places of worship in Pakistan. Uh, so by all means, Salman, just tell us a little bit of that to segue ourselves into closing tonight's program that you went to Pakistan fairly recently and were um, paying your respects at these various places. And, and tell us a little bit about how 
uh, the Sufi practice got there and whether it's facing any persecution or, or, or whether, you know, tell us how things are in that regard. Yes, my brother, thank you very much. And um, I love you also very, very dearly as a father figure and as a brother in battle. Now we reference to the uh, verse of Mark 411 in the Holy Bible, where Christ says that those of you will get the inner mysteries will be taught the inner mysteries while those on the exoteric will be taught the parable version of Christianity. Same thing we have in Islam, where the people of the bench, who were the, the Sufis, they were taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the inner mysteries of al-Islam, while the people on the exoteric divided into their own groups, as we see with Sunni, Shia, everyone interpreting uh, the Islamic faith in their own ways. And uh, we see even when the Knights Templars were in the Holy Land, they were studying with the Sufis in North Africa and the Middle East, and they took that knowledge back to Europe, and that's what we know as Freemasonry in the West today. So Sufi Islam is the Eastern parent of Freemasonry. And uh, when you look at the Arabic numbers 787, that's the Masonic square and compass. That means Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. So everything is about Allah. And even here you see the Knights Templars, uh, in the Masonic groups, they wear the hats with the wool on top of it because they are paying respects to the Sufis, the Suf, the wool, because that's who they who they studied under. And uh, Sufism extends North Africa. Believe it or not, Brother Douglas, they 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 even have Sufi orders in China. Uh, one of the uh, admirals who circumnavigated the globe before Magellan was Admiral Zhang He, who yes. himself was a Sufi Muslim. And uh, in Pakistan, when I went to go visit the shrines, I went and paid my respect at all of the shrines and asked, asked, asked the elders that are buried there for their help, that please God give me the strength to defend Islam, reform the Masonic Brotherhood, defend humanity, and defend all species of this earth, whether they be animal, human, insect, vampire, anything. And please let me leave a better world behind in, in, in better condition than what I inherited is as a human being. So that, that's my mission, my brother. I don't have any greed for anybody. I don't have any malevolent intention for anybody. Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them, know my heart, my intention, my soul. And that's why I've always been protected against any occultist. I shared my truth without any fear. Even running into you was by fate. So as long as we're on the side of light, no darkness can defeat us because they know that our strength and our light outweighs them. They're just trying to fight against their fate, which is defeat. Thank you. God bless you. And um, Zheng He, the admiral of the Chinese uh, treasure fleet, which circumnavigated the world long before Columbus. This was an individual who it makes perfect sense. I always knew him to be Muslim, uh, but never knew him to be of the Sufi order. Yeah. This is profound. God bless you for enlightening me. And uh, aside from that, it brings to our attention, please everyone be aware of the communist Chinese genocide of the Uyghur Muslims in uh, Northwest China and uh, what is traditionally called Eastern Turkestan. And I presume that is where some of these uh, Sufi orders would have been most open have prior the persecution, I presume, would be in that area of China in particular. Uh, but uh, all Muslims are suffering now. And try to remember, these are ethnically Caucasian peoples. This is a Caucasoid uh, ethnos that is being exterminated by the communist Chinese today. Uh, bear that in mind as uh, we struggle against the darkness. Um, and because this is Confederate Memorial Day, understand I often speak to the subject of black rights and Black Lives Matter. Understand that uh, the American Civil War between the states was prior to the white American consciousness of black rights at all. The, the blacks were simply to the northerners and the southerners, a non-human species whose fate was collateral to their conflict. And their conflict, as I said, America being an empty echo of its European origins. The American Civil War, if you see it in this context, is the only way you can understand it, was a continuity of the Anglo-Saxon extermination against the Celtic fringe. In other words, the Romanized or Latinized British 
who inherited the Roman nose, which you see in the British nobility quite profoundly, is these large Roman noses, which brings us down almost to the point of caricature. But the whole point is that they were Romanized with the invasion of the Roman Empire, and they spent a great deal of time carrying out the Roman Empire's agenda of exterminating the Celtic peoples that were driven out of Gaul, in this case, the Welsh, the Scots, and the Irish. And their attempts to exterminate these Celtic peoples uh, carried over across the Atlantic because in North America, the southern states were overwhelmingly settled by Gallo-Celtic peoples. In other words, uh, Irish, Scots, Welsh, and French Huguenots or French Protestants who had warred against the church and uh, French uh, refugees from the British conquest of Canada who fled Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these wound up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and many of the southern states, whereas in the northern states, it was overwhelmingly colonized by Anglo-Dutch Teutonic peoples. Uh, these were people, uh, the reason why New York's city's original name was New Amsterdam. Uh, so you had this white Protestant ethic uh, in the north, and you had the more Gallo-Celtic uh, culture in the south, and the American Civil War between the states was simply a racial war, but it was a racial war between white peoples. The, the Anglo-Teutonic North, uh, the Dutch Anglo-Saxon Protestants attempted, as the British had done, to exterminate the Celtic fringe. Their attempt was genocidal warfare against the southern states, and when the southern states established their resistance to the North, the Ku Klux Klan, it was based in terms of their symbolism and in, in, even as the Confederate States symbolism had been on um, Scottish rights masonry. And so you had many Masons as the founding fathers of the Confederate States as Masons had been the founding fathers of the Northern States. Their real conflict, obviously Mason against Mason was based on race. Uh, the uh, Northern uh, Anglo-Dutch uh, warring to exterminate the Gallo-Celtic South. Mm -hmm. So this is how you have to understand the Ku Klux Klan as a kind of Palestinian liberation organization that resorted to terrorism to maintain their cultural identity. And uh, so if you don't understand the American Civil War and its aftermath without that dynamic in mind, you don't understand it at all. The entire fate of Black Americans was very peripheral and collateral to that had not Abraham Lincoln been shot in the head by a Confederate States soldier uh, and effectively officially became the last official fatality of the American Civil War between the states. He was hell-bent on deporting all Blacks from America, period. And just as the British had used uh, the Blacks of their empire, uh, had basically converted them to biological waste in the sense of unwanted humanity and dumped them in a landfill that is today called Sierra Leone where they speak the King's English in the coast of Africa. So too, Lincoln established Liberia, which uh, speaks the president's English. And these were former American slaves that were dumped there as the first wave of what was to be all black Americans. And Liberia therefore flies the American flag. You can look at their flag. It's an American flag with a single star and a blue field. They are, feel themselves to be the lost American state. Uh, and uh, they, of course, were the only nation on earth to officially use the United States dollar as their official currency. Uh, and um, so people understand this, the black Americans whose uh, rights I often speak of, we have to understand that in context, that's separate uh, from the Civil War itself, which was very much a white issue, a white on white issue, a Masonic issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that sense, you can get a better grasp of history. Well, uh, so that brings us back to the holiday today. Remember, this is also the month of the military child. So what we discussed was relevant to that. This is also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And what we discussed was relevant to that as well. So we managed to cover all of the relevant topics of this day and this month. And I uh, am thankful to Allah, the God, who is the same God that Christians worship uh, when you are following true Christianity. Uh, or true Islam. Believe me, there's nothing worse in the world than an ignorant Christian or an ignorant Muslim. Yes. And everybody judges the totality of the faith based on idiots from either side. 
understand that the reason this is so important is that for the Middle Ages, which had dominated human interaction throughout the Atlantic for nigh a thousand years, there was no such thing as politics. A man's religion was his politics. Mm. You lived or died and killed on the basis of being a Muslim or a Christian. And Muslims or Christians would kill each other based on their interpretation of what brand, what paradigm of Islam or Christianity they were following. Yes. Whether Byzantine Orthodox Christian or Protestant or Roman Catholic or in the case of the Muslims, Sunni or Shia, with the Sufi managing to distance themselves mostly from this kind of secularized religious ideology, the mm. ideological uh, processing of a religious reality, uh, the Sufis stayed apart and they stayed spiritual. And uh, so when it comes to this concept of uh, Christian and Islam, these were the superpowers of their day that battled for the world. We are returning now to this kind of processing, this kind of paradigm. So it's more important than ever that uh, both Salman Sheikh and I help to, in our own ways, do our best to show the way, to convey the true message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, so that we yes. can make certain that this return to a religious sense of consciousness or cognizance is not a repeat of the dark ages. Absolutely. And I, and I stand, I stand with you through the entire process, my brother. God bless you. And blessed be thy weekend and blessed be all thine own. And uh, we will speak again very soon. Asalaamu Alaikum and may God and the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him always protect you, my brother with love and happiness. God bless you in turn, my dear brother. God bless you, my son, and uh, praise be to Allah, and peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad, his Amen. messenger. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Take care. So how do we hang up? <laughs> uh, let me just... Uh...